beautiful flower, but... Hello again, everybody. You may have missed me the last time I said hello. I'm afraid our internet went down. That's very disastrous, of course. It means we can't send you a picture. But here we are, back again, and I'm going to be looking at things closer to the ground. My name is James. This time, James, not Jamie, but James. And it's wonderful to be with you here in Africa. We have got Senzo on camera, magnificent example of uh, Zulu hood here in South Africa. And he is going to be filming me, and we have got some interesting things down here. Now, I'm going to teach you something about plants today, in fact, about all organisms that are alive, living organisms, because there's no such thing as a non-living organism unless it's dead, really. What we have here is a grass plant. Now, every single organism here 
every grass, every flower, every insect, every spider, every mammal has a Latin name. And I'm going to teach you the Latin name of this grass because it's such a fun name to say. Its English name is the carrot seed grass, but its Latin name, you listen carefully everybody, is Tragus Bertaronianus. Okay? It's two words. Tragus is the first word, and the second word is Bertaronianus. And so we're going to say it together. On the count of three. One, two, three. Tragus Bertaronianus. Once more. Tragus Bertaronianus. So now you can go running around the playground today shouting, Tragus Bertaronianus! Tragus Bertaronianus! And you'll remember this special carrot seed grass. And the reason that I don't like this grass very much is because if you put, pull these things off, you pull these seeds off. Now watch what happens. If I stick them to myself, you see, they're like Velcro. Velcro is that special stuff that's used for straps, and you probably got it on some of your clothes or your shoes. And what this very clever grass does, although it's not very nice for us, it will attach itself like this to the hooves and fur of passing animals. So if an animal comes past here and kicks this little plant, this Tragus bertaronianus grass, it will carry these seeds with it. And then, eventually, it will, they'll drop off, or the animal will scratch them off, they'll fall onto the soil, and possibly the animal will stand on them and bury them in the sand, and then they will grow. So it's really quite clever to have these seeds. But if you get these seeds stuck in your socks, you have to throw your socks away because you'll never get them out again. So that is the very special grass called the carrot seed grass, or, altogether, Tragus bertronianus. All right, let's go back to Ralphie. He's got something called a wildebeest. I think you met it earlier on today, but he's still with them and wondering if they're going to go and have a drink, perhaps. Thanks, James. Yes, and, well, remember, I'm sure all you kiddies would have seen on The Lion King, uh, the, the animals that stampeded when the hyenas chased them down into that ravine, and they all stampeded, and Simba got caught down there, and then Mufasa had to come and save him. Well, these are the same animals, the wildebeest, or gnu, as some other people call them, and that is the name that they give them because of the noise that they make because they go gnu, gnu, gnu. So that's um, quite interesting. But you see, it's still very hot now at this time of the day. And so they're very much just relaxing in the shade. And you can see with those zebras there as well, everybody just sticking together because they both eat grass. So the zebras and the wildebeest eat grass, and they have one common enemy, and that is the lions. So if they all stay together, they can very easily pick up on the lions, and maybe leopard, and sometimes hyenas. So they try to help each other out a little bit. And because they eat the same food, well, it makes sense that they move together as well. Emily, that's a good question. Impala, they eat a little bit uh, more different um, plants. They will also eat grass, but they can eat leaves as well. So they're a bit of a mixed feeder. And they can survive in different habitats where the zebra and the wildebeest, because they, they only eat grass, they need to stay where there's lots of grass. And that's mostly out on the plains. And... Uh, well, the impala do much better, and there's, there's a lot more impala because of that around Africa, because they can eat a range of different food. And that's a nice male there, a big boy. He's, uh, he's got the horns. The, the girls or the females, they don't have horns. Okay, well, it sounds like Steve has found you a very interesting animal and one of those that like to stay with Impala as well. So it's like a team, like the wildebeest and zebra. Let's go over to him and see which animal that is. Good afternoon, boys and girls. We're just trying to sneak up here on a troop of baboons. There they are in the road up ahead. 
name is Steve Falkenbridge. Welcome. I'm joined by Seb on the camera. And the baboons are not very relaxed. They're moving away from us. They are our cousins, distant relatives, and they are very well native to the African savannah. I'm just going to sneak forward a little bit here without starting the car. Well, I'm going to have to start the car. There's a couple of youngsters just playing just on the right over here in the bush. If you can see them, Seb. James is talking about scientific names. These guys have got the scientific name Papio Capensis, and the Papio relates to their dog like face. They have got enormous canine teeth. I'm sure your teacher is going to send us through questions, but don't be shy. Send us through your questions. These baboons have got enormous teeth, much bigger even than that of a lion. And they are omnivores like ourselves, feeding on fruit. Here we go, Seb. Here's a nice one here, feeding on the guaris. It's busy feeding on a little fruit tree there. They've got very nice ripe berries at the moment. They taste very good. Look how well he's able to climb, or she. That's a youngster. They live in troops of up to 40, 50 animals. And they've got enormous canines, like I said, especially in the big males. And the big males lead the troop, a group of them, like a gang, four or five, maybe six males. Here's a nice cute one giving us a, a frontal seb on the left there. There we go. Don't you see your brother or cousin in there? I do. I most certainly do. Itchy face. Look how well they balance on that branch, though. Beautiful that we're able to spend time with the baboons. Tallulah, you want to know if I went to college to become a safari guide? I did, but a lot of people don't. You don't need to do a degree. Uh, some people can do just some short courses to get out here. Uh, but some people, like Ralph and myself, have gone through nature conservation courses. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily get you to this exact level. There's diff many, many different types of routes. I mean, James didn't do... He didn't do a nature conservation degree, he did music or something like that. So if you get an interest in the bush and you come out here and you want to do it, there's very there's many, many ways of doing it without having to go to university. There are lots of courses or, or places that offer short courses, a month or two, three months in the bush. You learn all the practical stuff. But the one thing I must tell you is that it never stops. You never stop learning. Every day you're learning something new. And that is the mindset. Come out here with a great amount of enthusiasm and willingness to learn. And every single day be prepared to add new knowledge to all of the stuff that you've been adding to your brain. Well, it looks like James Hendry is still on foot. Let's go up to him for an update. Well, I'm certainly not flying, everybody. I'm still walking, yes. And we've got here a very special little rodent. And this special little rodent, is, of course, is called a squirrel. But what's really interesting about this small little rodent is that it's a baby. The adults are about twice that size, and that little one there is probably only about four inches long, excluding the tail, and the adults, I guess, would be about eight inches long, including the tail, and I'm sure they've got a little home inside a hole here in this dead tree. And I wonder if there isn't perhaps another one inside, maybe another baby, or if the parents aren't somewhere around here. Maybe they're gathering nuts, which of course these tree squirrels do, just like the tree squirrels or the squirrels you've read about in storybooks. Milo, this is a good question to ask while there's a little thing sitting out in the open like that. You say, how cold will it get here? Milo, it doesn't get very cold here. The very coldest temperature I've ever experienced here was 4 degrees Celsius, which is round about, ooh, it's probably about 37 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Uh, but it doesn't normally drop that cold. Normally, uh, the very coldest days in winter would be about 9 or 10 degrees Celsius, which in Fahrenheit must be somewhere around 45 degrees or so, so it really doesn't get very cold. 
But a little thing like this will get cold. And so on a very cold winter morning, a little squirrel like this will be snug and safe inside a tree hole, hopefully with its mum or dad very close by, or perhaps a brother or sister, so it can stay warm. Look, it's coming through the bottom there. You see its tail in there? And now it's gone into its... Oh, no, it's back out again. There it is. I think it's on its own. I don't think it has any brothers or sisters. And I think it's waiting for its mum or dad to come back and bring it perhaps a marula nut to eat. Which is delicious. All right, we're going to carry on. Let's go back to those hungry, berry-eating baboons. We're trying to get another look at them, but they've decided to go into the very thick bush. We could hear them making all sorts of funny noises off to our right-hand side. Baboons are very much like people uh, with their kids. They also need some discipline. There you can see them walking there. Luke, you want to know what the baboon's um, predators are? And lion and leopard are definitely two of the main predators of baboon. But uh, that is one of the reasons why they hang out in a group with big males to defend them. Because they will confront a lion and a leopard if need be to defend their offspring and their youngsters. But some of the biggest threats that, that come towards baboons are other baboons. So a gang of males might come in and try to take over this gang. And then that leads to a takeover. And that can be quite sort of damaging to the troop in the initial stages. But the strongest will always do what they need to do. I'm going to see if we can maybe try to find another spot here. If you're not playing the game, you have one? There we go. He's enjoying the sunshine. Keegan, they have long tails. You don't know why they have long tails. Um, mainly for balance. The tails, Tegan, maybe the, 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 the tail, just like in monkeys, is mainly for balance in the tree. And if you ever watch the female walking with her baby, it walks, it's beautiful because the baby sits on her back like a Harley Davidson, leaning on that tail, almost like a big Harley Davidson bike rider. But I think the tail's primarily for balance. Um, we lost the tail a long time ago because we started walking upright and we don't climb trees that well. And uh, I think if we had one, it would make our balancing in the trees much, all that much better. You can see that very dog-like face, can't you? Emmy, they hold onto trees with their opposable thumbs. You see, there we go, look at his hands. His hands are very much like our hands, but then his feet are quite similar to the hands as well. So our feet have changed because we walk so upright all the time, but their, their feet are very, very good at holding on to things. And there you can see, how he's sitting like a typical boy in the sunshine, legs wide open, <laughs> hands on his hips or on his legs. And they've got very, very strong hands. Baboons are incredibly strong. A small baboon would very easily overpower a human. Kennedy, you want to know if the, the baboon's parents teach them how to climb. And they are born very, very small. And they attach to mum's tummy, just this little black mass attaches there and holds onto the stomach. And uh, mum teaches it most of the stuff. Uh, while she's sitting around with them, they get to play and run and jump with all the others while things are safe. And while they're going through huge stages of grooming and spending time with each other, and then the babies run and jump and play. But it's all learned behavior. They have to spend a lot of time learning. And they follow in the troop all the time. And that's also when we heard some noises earlier. It's a discipline. When youngsters misbehave, the adults step in and give them a hiding from time to time. It can hear, can sound quite, quite bad, but uh, discipline often sounds like that. James, you want to know if baboons live elsewhere? Um, all over Africa, really. Um, all the savannas of South Africa, we get baboons. Uh, we get the Cape, so down in Cape Town area. Um, they've got a huge range. They just don't do well in very, very dry places. So in the savannah, um, and they have sort of evolved to be more of an open plain specialist, but they need to have rivers with tall trees where they rest at night, where they sleep and spend the night. So it seems like we're losing signal here. Let's go back up to Ralph and see what he's up to.
Oh, Steve, it seems like you guys have been having fun with those baboons. That's one of my favorite animals, hey. I can sit and watch them all day. They're uh, very fun and uh, do lots of comical things, don't they? But, well, I tell you what, I'm looking for elephants. Because since I've been back here on Juma, I haven't been able to find any elephants. I've only seen lots of tracks and signs, lots of trees that have been pushed over and where they've been eating branches and leaving some of the uh, drag marks of their trunks on the road. So we're trying to look for some of those big animals. And wouldn't you believe it, they're such big animals, but they can be really difficult to find when they're here in the thick bush. So it's not always that easy. So I'm looking for elephants and leopards. Zoe, well, we haven't really been attacked in our Jeep when we've been filming. We have had some uh, animals coming very close and getting very inquisitive and curious of us. And uh, while well, we've been trained uh, for many years as rangers and we know the different signs that the animals give us that uh, when they're angry with us or we, we get too close, maybe they've got some babies or they've got some food or they're not in a very good mood, then uh, we don't stay very long or we don't get very close but uh, we know when they're in that kind of uh, mind or when they when they are happy that we can be near, near to them and then that's when we'll stay close oh, look what I've got up ahead for us I think it's a couple of pumbas but they look like they might have just had a wallow uh, they are running I'm not sure if we're going to be able to see them for too long so we'll just have to wait and see. But there they are running through the bush. I might just pull off over here so that we can get a, a look at them as they... Oh, there they go. Shame they are scared of, of everything because everything wants to eat them. So let's just see if we can get a little bit closer. There's also a little antelope running through the bushes. There they are. Let's have a look. There we go. Looks like mommy, daddy, and a little piglet. See, they're also going into the shade. It's also quite hot. But the, the warthogs, they like to go and wallow in the mud when it's very hot. And that's how they keep cool. I wonder where their little pool is that they can go and find. Uh, very nice because after they've been wallowing in the mud then they like to go and scratch themselves on a tree or on a rock and get all the mud off and it pulls all the little parasites and the ticks and fleas and gets rid of them because they don't um, have a vet or a doctor that will take them and clean them and wash them they need to look after themselves and they now have disappeared behind the bush let me move a little bit forward and see if we can just see them there a little bit better. They seem to have relaxed a little bit. And there they, they're not too worried about us. That's nice. Now we can see them. Look at a lot of whiskers they got on the face. Eh? Mommy and Daddy have both got whiskers. It's quite funny, hey? Hehe. <laughs> and when they run, you'll see that tail go straight up. There you go. See that? Look how the tail goes up. That's so that they can follow each other in the long grass. Because that little one there, you won't be able to see mom. Look how he disappears in the grass. Now, Eloise, the, the warthogs wallow in the mud, especially when it gets very hot. So they try to cool off in the mud and they also do it so that they can uh, get rid of those uh, ticks and fleas. They go and wa rub up against a, a tree because the mud gets hard in the sun on their skin and then they'll go and rub up on a tree and the fleas and ticks get stuck in the mud and then when they rub on the tree the mud comes off with the ticks and fleas. So very clever are the pumbas, aren't they? Well they've disappeared now so I think we will do the same and continue up down the road. Speaking of long grass, it seems like James is in some, uh, and let's go over and see what kind it is. 
He is in some long grass, and I mean a special kind of grass called Eragrostis, which means love grass. Isn't that amazing? It's called love grass. I'm not sure why. I think it's because the seed is shaped like a heart. Now, what we have here... You got him. He's a little grasshopper. And there are lots of grasshoppers around here, just as the season, the summer season, comes to an end. So the grasshoppers are all mature now. They're all adults, and they're laying eggs in the ground, and then eventually they're all going to die, I'm afraid, and then their babies will come next season. Because, of course, we're going into winter time as you go into summertime. And you see that one there. So that's one of them, and there are others that aren't quite so colourful, just hopping around in here. And if I'm very quiet, I'm going to put my head into the grass here, and then I'm going to be quiet for ten seconds. Can you hear that sound? That... You hear that? It's loud. That's all of the grasshoppers talking to each other. It's their legs rubbing against their abdomen, so a little bit like a cricket makes a sound. They rub their back legs against their, their sides like this, and it makes a sound. And I think it's so that the males can attract a female, and then they can mate, and then the female will go and lay eggs. Beautiful. I'm going to sit here for a little bit longer and listen to the singing grasshoppers. You're going to go to see an animal that likes to play in the water. Yes, we have indeed. It doesn't just play in the water. They live in the water, spending most of their time. Wow, look at that. Fish eagle just came down. Sorry. Sorry to change the subject. This fish eagle which looks very much like your American bald eagle, came flying down to the water's edge. I don't know what it quite, what quite it saw there, but the African fish eagle, beautiful, beautiful bird. They live in pairs for life, and they feed on fish, as the name implies. And although the hippo that we saw moments ago, you would think, Sarah Jane, there we go, there's one of the birds that we see. Excuse me, I have <coughs> apologies for my sneeze there. So the fish eagle feeds primarily on fish, but will also feed on all sorts of other small things it can get its talons on. Very, very successful hunter. And uh, you always see them in, well, near water holes like this one. We are at Chitwa Chitwa, another property just next door, another game reserve right next door to Juma. It's always a great place to come. There's the lodge at the back there. Great place to come for all sorts of animals. There's always hippos here. Ariona, hippos, you want to know if they are dangerous. And yes, hippos can be incredibly dangerous. Um, they actually are responsible for killing more people in Africa than any other mammal. Now, we need to understand that, first of all, to really truly understand why. Hippos don't eat meat. They feed on grass, and they live in the water. They feel very comfortable in the water. And when they get out the water to go feed on the grass, they feel very vulnerable. And uh, what happens in rural Africa, we have lots of people who still walk down to these big dams or water holes or rivers to get water for drinking and for cleaning and for washing and all sorts of things and then you run into something like that that's trying to get back to the water and they quite often will run you over when you weigh four and a half thousand pounds and you run over someone it's going to hurt a lot and uh, quite often the wounds inflicted by such damage is what leads to the death of these people out here they're not looking to seek to kill people and then there's also lots and lots of people fishing. But let's quickly go to Ralph. He has a bird. Yes, everyone. And look at this. This is one of our little um, birds of prey that we get here in, in this part of the world. And this one is quite special in that 
He's so small, but uh, he's also very voracious. He can hunt little birds and catch reptiles like snakes, small snakes, because he is very small. And he'll also eat anything else, but he mostly eats and catches little birds. And he's called a little banded goshawk, or shikra. Very pretty little bird that, and he's just jumping up a little bit further now. He's nicely in the light there. Wow, look at that. See that very orange eye? And he'll be he'll be looking for some food. See how he bobs his head up and down? And that's because he can see very far, but he, he can't tell the distance very well. He can't tell how far it is. So he just puts his bumps his head up and down a little bit and then that's the way that he tells how far the prey is away and I think he might have flown off oh there is a lilac breasted roller that's a different bird altogether this one eats little insects so like grasshoppers and locusts and anything else that flies around so he eats mainly insects where that shikra who was only a little bit bigger than him uh, he's got very big talons, though. Uh, he goes for little birds. But this uh, lilac-breasted roller is after little insects. Very pretty colours, eh? Hey? So, now that we've spotted a couple of little birds, uh, I think Steve, where he is at Chitwa Dam, he'll have a lot of birds to show you, so let's head on over to him. We do. There are lots of birds here, and there's also an aeroplane flying over our heads. I don't know if you could hear that, but it just buzzed us. Called a red-billed oxpecker. Oopsie, he doesn't like getting his feet wet. And there's a juvenile, and he is feeding on ticks. And Griffin, what do hippos eat, you'd like to say, you'd like to ask? I think I answered it a few moments ago. They feed on grass. With their very, very big mouth, they move through the savannah and they just munch, munch, munch. They're not very selective. They'll be eating all of those grasses that James is showing you. Uh, they don't have a very small mouth, so they just eat absolutely everything that comes in their way. But they're looking for grass, only for grass. Hmm, Joseph, I don't know how many teeth hippos have. You want to know how many teeth they have? Well, they've got the two really big sharp uh, canines or incisors in the, the top of the mouth and then two in the bottom and then at the back they've got a whole set of molars at the back there but I can't remember how many they have it must be about 10 sets or so but I'm only guessing right now but it's not a lot of teeth for the size of their mouth Tegan, you want to know why they have sharp teeth if they don't eat meat? Well, that's because they fight. Uh, the babies get protected by the mother against crocodiles. If crocodiles try and come near the babies, there's a little baby, um, then the mother will bite it in half. And the males, when they fight for territory and for dominance of females, they have enormous battles with each other. And those big teeth are used in huge clashes between enormous males fighting for the same patch of water and also if a lion or something outside the water decides to try and hurt them well they can give it a proper bite for defense and fighting well it seems like james is showing you wonderful little things on the ground let's go back over to him Well, it's not quite on the ground, it's on another wonderful piece of grass. And it is a very special little butterfly. And you know, there's so many butterfly species, I'm not sure which butterfly that is, actually. It's very small, only about, oh, I'd say a quarter of an inch long, and black and white. So it might be something called, uh, or it might be one of the whites. We get butterflies like that that are called whites, lots of different kinds. So I think that's probably what it is there. But often, you know, when butterflies open their wings, they're a different color on the other side. So it might even be one of the blues. Oh, it's flown away. 
I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching. Let's not worry about it. Okay, so that was a nice butterfly. Now, if you come over here, in this amazing piece of grass, look what we have here. It is a special spider. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's a jumping spider. This is the kind of nest they make. And this beautiful little nest will have the eggs of the jumping spider inside. And it's so small that I don't think you can see it. That's how tiny the jumping spider is. Now, Milo and your friend, whose name I'm afraid I've forgotten, let's try and have it again. Gavin. Milo and Gavin, you're wondering about what cameras we use and what technology we use. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll show you. Let's leave that. Then I'm going to ask Senzor to give me his camera. Come over here, Senzor. <laughs> Okay, and I'll show you Senzor and the equipment he has. Turn around, Senzor. So this is some of the stuff that we use. That's the big backpack. And so what happens is the picture comes from the camera, goes into this backpack, and it goes up out of here, and it goes all the way along to a tower, which is, can you see the tower? Yes, there's the tower. Senzor will find you the tower. And it goes into that tower, and then from that tower, there it is. So we're sending a picture from the backpack into that tower. From that tower, it goes into a place called the final control room. And there are a lot of people working in the final control room. And then from the final control room, it goes to London. And then from London, this is in, in, on the internet, from London, it goes all the way to you guys on the internet. Isn't that amazing? It really is quite astonishing technology, and I'm afraid I can't explain more than that about it because I don't really understand exactly how they do what they do, these technical people that work with us. Yeah, so that's basically how it happens. All right, let's go back across to Steve. I'm going to have a small sugary treat on the end of this grass. Mm. Well, well, you're still here at the dam, and we've managed to find a second bird species for you these are the Egyptian geese the large ones there and then that one wagging around in the background that's just disappeared from shot was called a wagtail there it goes at the back there I think it was a wagtail and these Egyptian geese I believe are even in America now they are very loud and they are also vegetarians having a little bit of a drink there and with their specially modified beak they're able to filter feed organic material out of the water so they do very very well here because the hippos provide all sorts of vegetation in the water because they feed on grass outside and they come inside the water yes they poo inside the water and that feeds lots and lots of fish and also the Egyptian geese will be feeding on the algae that's growing on the d dead organic material that the hippos have brought in Very pretty though. You just haven't heard them make a noise yet. They're pretty but don't sound very attractive. You can't have both in the bird kingdom. You can't be pretty and sound good. Troy, you want to know how the hippos swim? Well, they don't actually swim, Troy. They um, are just floating there. Oh, well, they're just sitting on the bottom. The ground is quite, um, oh, I said floating, but I didn't mean floating. Uh, they are basically sitting on the bottom of the water there. They just tuck their legs in to submerge themselves more, but they are not, in fact, swimming. They don't swim, even though they live most of their life in the water. Uh, these water holes are never very deep, and they can run along the bottom of the water to cover deeper areas, and holding their breath for over six minutes. Isn't that incredible? That's a very long time. 
Well, boys and girls, thank you so much for joining us on this school drive safari, coming to you all the way from Juma and Chitra here in South Africa, the Sabi Sands. Thank you for joining us and your lovely questions and comments, and I hope to see you again very, very soon. And on that note, we're going to go back over to James on the bushwalk. Comments. Questions and comments. Oh, sorry, I was just having a small song to myself, everybody. Uh, welcome to the regular drive, what we used to call the adult drive, until we realized that was slightly ambiguous in a very unpleasant way. Uh, so, welcome to the regular drive. Uh, for those of you who have just joined us, please talk to us using the hashtags of our live on Twitter. Otherwise, you can use the chat stream on YouTube. Any of those things will work. You can send us your questions or your comments, or indeed you may send us your insults, as some feel compelled to do from time to time. <laughs> I do, really. It's quite funny. That's very hurtful. Now, a very interesting tree here, Acacia exuvialis. And you can see that the thorns have been used as homes by many creatures, and I suspect mostly by the slender ant. The slender ant, which doesn't live in vast colonies like many other ant species, likes to live in these thorns. I wonder if we won't find the husk of a slender ant here. I don't think there are any living ones. It's thin, no, not quite. You can see the hole in here, though. Mm. Well, the trick here is not to spike your eye out while you're looking. Robert, you're wondering if I often talk to plants. Uh, look, it's not something I do very often, no, Robert. Um, I have been known to sing every so often in the vicinity of plants, though, and that definitely does cause a die-off like the one you see at the moment occurring on this plant. So this could have been because I came past here and sang a while back. I'm just trying to see if we can't find the husk of a slender ant, but I can't find one now. I think they've all gone. But interestingly, uh, this is not the natural state for the thorn. So there you can see a hole in the thorn. And the ant dug in, uh, exuded some sort of uh, poison or toxin, caused a swelling in the thorn, uh, which created a sort of spongy material inside that became food for the ant and its larvae, and uh, possibly even the adult. And you can see that this tree was fest not festooned, that's the wrong word, it's a beautiful word, but it's the wrong one, it was infested with them. It's also been attacked by any number of other creatures. I think elephants have had a go at it. I wonder if buffalo haven't rubbed themselves up against it, but still it survives. It's a very brave and stoic fellow. Yeah in the African wilderness. Good. Right, let's continue. All right, I believe that Ralph is uh, doing what is known as just driving along. I don't think he's just driving along. I bet that he's looking for something. Yes, well, everyone, um, we are still on the lookout for leopard and elephant and hyena i thought i'd just pop in here quickly at the um at the old elephant carcass and just have a look and see if there were any of the hyena still around but uh, i do think that the other day when we saw them all around here it was um just after that quite a good downpour of rain and i think it started to release the smell again of these bones i think that's what brought them all back here and it was nice to see a lot of hyena altogether again, but well, for the moment it looks like there's not too much happening here now. But that skull has been moved. I wonder if it's down to some of the um, the elephants coming past. You know, they can nudge the bones around of of uh, their fallen compatriots. Sometimes they come and nudge them and sort of push and shove the the bones and and uh, whether it's um. Uh, sort of in in uh, feeling for their for their lost friend, or whether it's curiosity, or you know, there's a lot of sort of studies around that, and there's not really conclusive evidence to say what the animal is actually thinking about when it's doing that. But there is definitely a real connection, um, and it's not really uh, true this kind of uh, elephant graveyard type story. Um, but uh, I've seen it in the desert in Namibia when where an elephant has died and. Uh, 
each herd that has come past has, uh, and I've seen from the tracks alone, that uh, they really spend a lot of time around that that spot where an elephant has died, even if it's not from their own herd. So but the, the herds that it is um, from, obviously they spend more time, but um, it, it's uh, very, very interesting. Looks like there's been a couple of birds sitting on top of that skull as well, because there's a lot of um, that uric acid that's running down the side there. So maybe the vultures and so on that we hear, they've been perched on top of it and also defecated down the side of it. Now that it's moved, it's obviously in a different position as, as it was previously. So welcome back to all the other viewers that uh, uh, obviously we've left now the, uh, the school drive. So we'll, um, we'll look forward now to what's going to happen on the rest of the drive. And this is now, for me, as that sun starts dipping, uh, the prime time to start finding some predators. So I think we're going to head on down to Twin Dams. Let's see what we can find down there. Okay, and as I'm heading down towards um, Twin Dams, I believe Steve has left Chitwa Dam, but he's all got all sorts of gadgets and gizmos uh, with him. Let's see what uh, he's up to. Okay, we're trying to um, not get stuck in the sand, first of all. We have left the dam, and there was a, a little bird party of southern black tits having a fight. Not southern. Um, what were they called? There they are. Southern black fly catchers up at the top of that tree at the back. They're having a little bit of a territorial dispute, it seemed. They're very easily confused with the forktail drongo, but have a look at how, how shallow that tail is. Not very, th not very thick. You can also clearly see in that image there that the eye is black. Where forktail drongo has got a red eye. So a lot of people overlook these southern black fly catchers and they think. Ooh, that is a Forks of Drongo, and is not. The call is different. The, the bulk of them as well is different. They're not as big and strong in the bill and in the body as the Forks of Drongos. And f fantastic. But they are very similarly related. They are also a fly catcher. And uh, they're a marvelous bird. So if that is a new bird for any of you out there, please let me know. Because for years and years and years, I know people that overlook those birds because they just think it is something it's not. So, southern black tit is that we find around here. That is indeed the southern black fly catcher. And I have a theory of my own about the southern black fly catcher, and uh, you're all welcome to challenge it if you like. But what we know about the is that they are very strong and aggressive birds and a lot of birds leave them alone because of their nature the honey badge of the sky we call them so I've got a very strong belief that the southern black flycatcher in fact mimics the appearance of the um, of the fork tail drongo so as to go unnoticed and get by with a lot of things that they wouldn't normally be allowed to get by with and that goes as well for the fiscal flycatcher here is a fork tail drongo sitting at nine o'clock the same thing goes with the fiscal flycatcher which mimics that of the fiscal shrike there is look at the difference in the tail thickness there and they behave in a very similar way okay well from our birds we are going to be going over to someone i'm not quite sure because i'm not getting it clear in the air but we'll see you back soon Oh, I wonder what's happening there, Steve-O. You've obviously gathered the gremlins. But uh, nonetheless, we're still out and about. We're here next to Twin Dams. It doesn't seem like there's uh, too much happening here. A couple of Egyptian geese down there and the ever-present um, blacksmith lapwings. But they don't, they're resident. They won't be going anywhere. Um, and I do want to go in the Mlilwati, but I'm a little bit worried now that Steve... He's not got the best of signal, so I don't want to be uh, getting into the same area as well. Well, same problem as well. So we'll maybe just stay a little bit 
in a good signal area. Okay, I've received the go-ahead that we can go and just test our luck down in the Umlawati. So I think that's what we're going to do. And while we try and see if we can find some elephant or leopard, let's go on over to James and see what he's been able to find. Well, we haven't found very much by way of large mammal, but we are sitting here at a little pan, a little water hole, and normally we'd expect in the sort of height of the winter, when it was very dry and if there was still water here or mud, we'd expect to find perhaps buffalo, uh, maybe rhino sitting here. But what we have found very clearly is evidence of hippo, and we're very glad that when we arrived here there weren't any hippo. You can see that's dung in the water, these sort of little dumplings of dung, if you like, <laughs> floating on the surface there. And I, I was saying to Rexon, who's looking after us today, I said, do you, you know, do you, where do you think it is? And he said, it's probably one of the ones in Bifflesook Dam. Maybe it comes here at night, has a rest on its own, a sort of private pub, if you like, and then it moves on. But it certainly left its dumplings for all to see. It's a lovely picturesque little spot. This is the kind of place that I would sit and have a, I don't know, an afternoon tea and perhaps a cream scone with some strawberry jam. Ooh, that would be nice. Nice thought, that. I hope those of you who are sitting at home with access to such things will now go and do precisely that uh, so that I might live vicariously through you. All right, so we're going to carry on from here. Where we are now is on Hyena Road, which is central northern parts of Juma. And we'll probably head a little bit further towards the east, towards Bifflesook Dam. And then from there, I suspect we'll turn around and head back uh, towards the main Vuyatela Dam, where the dam cam is, because nobody really knows where Horsana went yesterday. So I think that's probably what we'll do today. Rhonda, there'd be a lo lot of dead bushes around if that was the case. You say, if the animals, when the animal scent mark on bushes, does it kill them? Not at all. Uh, in fact, well, I don't know if it fertilizes. I'm sure it does fertilize the base of the plant. But with something like, I'll show you the kinds of bush they use. Come over here and I'll show you. They use these guari bushes like here. There's Rex. Hello, Rex. Patiently waiting for me to tell my story. <laughs> They use bushes like this quarry bush over here, and especially ones that are along the side of a road like this one is. And so you'd expect to find Hukumuri, the male leopard, walking along here and then lifting his tail, having a spray, and it has no deleterious effect on the plant at all, because if it did, of course, his scent wouldn't stay here. And so he pees on the plant, and then if it rains, he'll come past and pee on the same plant again. And they choose these guari bushes. I don't think so much because it, they don't die from the pee. I don't know of any plant that necessarily dies from being peed on by a leopard. But they are evergreen, and not much will eat them. And so if they pee on a plant like this, chances are the scent will survive longer than it would if they peed on some other kind of plant. hope that makes sense. But no, I don't think the pee-pee of the kitties uh, manages to kill any of the plants out here. I can tell you, however, that I, when I was a, <laughs> I moved into a house in Johannesburg uh, when I was a, a guitar teacher, and I was renting it, and in order to save costs, I said to, I said to the owner, who said, used to send a gardener around once a week to do the gardens, I said, look, look, I'll do the gardens, you just let, leave them be, and then, you know, it saves me the cost of having them, so he said, right, that's fine. So I thought, my mother's quite green-fingered, you see, so I thought what I'll do is I'll just get some advice from her and I'll dig up this patch, this flower bed here, and then I'll plant some seeds in it. And some alarming Franklins, we'll go and see what they were doing. And uh, my seeds didn't come up in a fairly large patch of areas. There were Namaqua and daisies, they just wouldn't come up. And eventually I poked my head out of the window one day and there was a cat digging, scrabbling about, not my cat, in the flower bed making deposits. And it was precisely where this vulgar animal had been making its deposits that my seeds 
failed to grow. Well, I tell you what, I sprayed that cat I did with a small sprayer of water and it did not return to relieve itself on what soon became a verdant flower bed. Let's go across to Ralph, who's got the other mm, cercopathene primate that we have here. Yes, and this primate is the one that likes to be a little bit more in the trees. Because remember, baboons, they like it to be on the ground a little bit more. They are quite good in the trees, but they're not as agile as the uh, vervet monkeys that we're looking at here. We don't have a clear visual on them, but these are a couple of youngsters, and they're really playing and jumping around and showing their acrobatics. I think they're having a wonderful time there. We just thought we'd stop because they were putting on a real show for us, jumping and leaping and really grabbing almost like trapeze artists. And you just see their tails there. And I'll use that also to help them grab onto the branches. But it's, it's, it's amazing how sometimes they take a real leap of faith and jump and land in the, in the thick leaves. Very, there we go. There's one. It's, it's real youngsters that are playing around. I wonder where the rest of the troop is. See, these are russet bush willows in front. I'm not quite sure what that is at the back. Oh, it looks like quarry. I think it's magic quarry. That's why there's no thorns or anything like that. That's why they can quite easily jump and not hurt themselves. And they, even at a young age, they, they know which trees. Look at those two having a wrestling match. I know it's trees they can jump and play around on like that. I'm sure they're also eating the berries like the baboons were doing. And Gary, thanks for your comment that you like monkeys. I also like them. They, they're so interesting. You can sit and watch them all day. Uh, it's pretty much like the baboons as well. And they're very human-like in a lot of ways. And they are primates, so we, we are sort of close cousins. They do come from the similar lineage. But there's lots of fun going on here. And these guys playing around. Now, Peter G., that's a very good question. Um, the name Vervet, or the origin of the name Vervet, um, is actually eluding me. I'm not quite sure. In Afrikaans, they call it a blow up which is basically just a blue monkey, which um, is a lot more descriptive. But I'd have to look that vervet. You know, I don't know if it's something to, closer to do velvet, you know, with a velvet-looking type coat that they have. Um, but I'm not quite sure. Very good question. We've always just called them vervet monkeys. And it's really the only true monkey that we get in southern Africa. We don't get any others. We get different baboons. But uh, the vervet monkey used to be extremely common, especially along the coastal areas, uh, along all the forested and treed areas. But um, obviously with a lot of human encroachment, um, and especially people bringing dogs, um, they have suffered quite a bit. And also because of their habits of being quite destructive. And there's one now that's showing himself quite nicely. There he is. Looks like a, a little bit of an older one. It looks like those teats are quite extended. That might be a mommy looking after these youngsters playing in the tree. He's doing a bit of babysitting. That's it. Come and show yourself. And Gemma, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think monkeys are so much fun as well. And they're always up to no good, playing around. And they are a lot of fun, um, except when they get into your kitchen. And they and they get onto or onto the coffee station, and they they really like sugar, and I've seen it a lot. Once they discover, uh, you know, at like these different wilderness lodges, 
the coffee station uh, very often like out on the on the stoop as we call it out on the viewing point uh, on the veranda and uh, the monkeys once they get a taste for that sugar that's there well they're there every morning and you've almost got to have somebody manning that station and to stop them from getting in and destroying and eating all the teas and coffees and biscuits and sugar but the sugar is a definite winner with them they love it I remember growing up uh, when I was a, a young warthog um, we went on holiday in the area of Cape Vidal or St. Lucia, which is now Isi Mangaliso World Heritage Site. And there's a lot of monkeys there, but there's also a lot of very high trees. And we used to go camping with caravans and so on. And um, one day the monkeys got into my parents' cupboard in the caravan where they had stashed all the sweets for our. For, for, there was quite a lot of kids around. There was a few families tra camping together. And these monkeys proceeded to go right up to the top of the trees and uh, start to feed on, uh, well, open this packet. And there was, it was a big male eventually that came and grabbed this packet and now uh, he commandeered it from all of the rest. But he sat there in the top. Oh, there's a little baby there coming to mum. And he sat there, and as he was breaking open the packet, um, there were sweets falling down. So all the kids, we were running around on the bottom, uh, collecting these sweets as the monkey was dropping them down. So it was actually the roles were completely reversed, where um, we were the little monkeys, and uh, he was the little human feeding us up top in the trees. And I'll always remember that. <laughs> Very cute. But we also used to then, um, just to deter them, we used to just put in a plastic snake inside the caravan. And so then they would see that right by the window. So they would climb in the window, they would see the snake, and that would really scare them, and they would run out. And it was uh, quite a natural way of trying to deter them. But uh, there were some old wily males that also would uh, climb in and bite the snake and, and literally rip it to pieces. So we'd often come back and we'd have to get ourselves another plastic snake. And that little baby looks like it's having a drink. There we go. Hello, cutie pie. Uh, Definitely is a little bit of a nursery going on here. All the little youngsters playing around and the adults just watching, making sure they don't get into trouble. It's nice in the shade here. As I said, it was quite hot a bit earlier. It still is a, quite warm, but we're very relaxed and chilled out here in the shade. And these monkeys know where to find these nice cool spots. And there's all sorts of little snacks with the guaris now in fruit so they can play and have the odd little tasty nibble it's incredible though even at that young age I mean they can really dive between the branches and, and there I think he's pulling off those little berries <laughs> he's very cute isn't he Thanks, everybody commenting about the cuteness. Very cool. And they're so agile. So, and that's it. They're a lot, they spend a lot more time in the trees compared to the, the baboons. Oh, there's a little bit of a wrestling match going on there. Mr. Public, um, they, uh, monkeys can disturb birds' nests um, uh, without, um, you know, unwittingly, especially when they're playing around like they are now. And doves' nests, and especially the birds that don't really go to too much care in where they position their nests. Doves literally place their nests anywhere, really. And, um, uh, yeah, they're one of the birds that th their nests get knocked out, they get blown out by the wind, they'll get bumped by monkeys, and, you know, well, they'll just go off and build another one. 
Well, the, I say build. It's not really a building. I can't even say it's a building because they literally just put a, put a few sticks together on a V or a branch, and that's their nest. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a haphazard. So the doves are a little bit vulnerable in that sense, but not too much. Right. I think uh, that question that came through, why they're called vervets, I think nobody better to ask that question than James. Let's hear what his answer is. Le songe, il est vervet. Le songe, il est vervet. The monkey is a vervet. I am told by my reliable mammal app that the name vervet is in fact a mispronunciation of the word vervet. Spelled in the same way, it is a colloquial French word for that kind of a monkey. A songe, of course, le songe, in my recollection of the French language, is in fact a generalized term for a monkey. Le songe, il est vevé. C'est bon. Did you like my um, beret that I had on there, Sinzo? <laughs> I've been... I've been I've been waiting that whole segment, practicing that. I'm so excited about it. All right, you don't have to listen to me anymore. You can go to something more spotted and much more beautiful than I. The Duke of Juma. We were about to set up the drone while well, the drone is ready to go. And um, look who materialized. He's going to walk right between us and Peter from Ankoro. Not a problem. He, he picks up his pace just a little bit to get between us. But is that not a relaxed male leopard? He was just scent marking down by the dam, and there's some impalas alarm calling off to the right. You'd almost think there's a leopard nearby. We're going to follow him, but he is heading directly west, which is maybe not a good sign. There. You can hear the impala. Males rutting off in the distance. He's going to get a might get a vehicle in the shot in a moment. Let's turn around here, shall we? How marvelous is that? The Duke of Juma materializes. There he goes. Yay! Wow, everyone. Here he is. We'll just see if we can follow him. Let me turn down my game drive radio there because it's very hard to focus. Obviously, when a leopard gets found, everyone gets very excited and they all want to come at the same time. But we were the closest and we're going to get him in a beautiful dapple afternoon light. I'm going to just stop there for a moment. Tell me, yes, I'm also glad he's sent marking. But, I mean, he's right here by Chitwa, so maybe he's just making a very, well, a much smaller sort of territory. Um, not sort of pushing his way back into where he was, but who knows? He's up, he's about, he's definitely staking claim to this territory anyway. And there is lots of impala and water in the area, so a marvellous place to be. I'm going to go around on the road. That, sorry, Seb. Just see him through the bushes there. The Duke of Juma materializes for a cameo on a Wednesday afternoon. Seb and I were considering going behind Chitwa Dam Wall and uh, we decided to try drone first and then he just popped out. Popped out as he does, as the leopards seem to do in this area. They just sort of materialize. There he is. He's 
looking into the open the, the impala rams that are doing their territorial rutting you can just hear a little go away bird there <coughs> marvelous let's try to get in behind these two vehicles Oh, Saskia, most certainly. Leopards can detect all sorts of wonderful smells. Um, and they actually hunt quite often through smell. So that what they'll do is sniff and follow Impala and Dacre and all sorts of other little creatures in their wanderings as they're looking for them. We've seen it quite often with a few of the leopards as they move through the thick bush with seemingly no, seemingly no visual of anything. Um, and just a, a scent on the ground and because they scent mark as well old factory communication is very very important for them most animals out here actually are very good communicators with the nose oh and um, I'm just going to stop there for a moment while we just smashed that bush isn't that beautiful there's one of the, the lodge vehicles behind they're enjoying a little bit of Tingana in the afternoon as he stops to give us a nice pose because behind us in the distance the Impala males are making their noises. There we go, he's going to rub his face and he's probably going to scent mark backwards there. Let's see. There we go. He's now scratching his feet. Lynn, scent marking, if it rains, it gets washed away almost immediately. So that's why after rain, you'll find predators or you'll find territorial holders. Look at him. His body language has changed. Can you see that? He spotted something. So as soon as there's rain, the scent marker gets washed away. And then the territory holder will move again and re-scent mark. Because the, the purpose for scent marking is to demarcate a territory. And if an animal comes across your territory and there's no fresh scent mark then it's actually available and up for grabs so it's very important for them to re-scent mark Seb I'm going to go around onto the road so that's why you'll often find after a rainy event your predators or your rhino Territorial holders, rhino, wildebeest, as well as leopard and lion, will go back around and remark all of those areas. Whole lot of impala off the side here. He's moving through the long grass over there. Try and we're getting to our western boundary with Chitwa and um, little Gauri just going to stop right there for you and if he keeps going on this trajectory that's about as far as we're going to be able to go with him but he's have you got him, Seb? He's just left of you there. Bottom left of the screen. There he is. How camouflage is that? Now, his intention is the impala herd in the glistening light behind us. And you can see how the shoulders changed shape as he got very low in the grass. Can you see that? Very, very low. He's not done yet to this beautiful Duke Tingana. 11 and a half odd year old male it's about as sort of old as they get still hold their territories thanks Peter oh he's not going yet hello we've got a male leopard just here in front of the car sorry about the spare tire there if we didn't have the spare tire that would be a marvelous shot go away bird in the background Why? Why? if you 
you go. You didn't see him there, but he just licked his lips. <laughs> Duke, I'd also love to know what his best kill is. Look at his body language. He's definitely interested in those Impala there. Look how he's sleeking away there. Very low. He's using the vehicles as cover, cheeky boy. And we're going to stay with him. We marvelous afternoon to get a leopard hunt. Sorry about my head. Oh, as I said, two other vehicles in the sighting. If he keeps going this way, we can't follow, but it's a good chance he's going to loop around towards his impala here. But the way he's headed, it's not looking very promising, unless he is doing the sneaky, sneaky leopard tactic of moving around his quarry. Okay, well, while we stay with him and watch his stalk in progress, let's go with James Henry and see if he's stalking up to anything. Uh, stalking? We're not stalking. We are approaching Biffle's Hook Dam, however. Uh, how's the old boy looking? Is he looking okay? Poor old fellow. Oh, apparently not bad. So here we are. We're just going to poke our heads over the dam wall here. Have a look and see if we can see what VM terms non-content. That is, of course, the hippopotami that live here. And then we'll find what can be described, I suppose, as secondary characters of ours, the family of Egyptian gooses, and their one, two, three, four... Oh, dear. No? Still seven? One, two, three, four, five... Yes, still seven little goslings. Well done. It's a relief. There are the hippo, popping their heads out. The world's most boring hippopotami. So for those of you who are new viewers, that family of geese has lost countless clutches of chicks, or goslings, I suppose. Uh, but this little clutch seems to have made it well so far. Uh, they're probably about, oh, I'd say about a month old now. Maybe? Maybe not quite that much. And they've still got seven of eight left. Now, I think you'll find that the hippopotamus here are not quite as entertaining as the ones in Chitwa Dam because there are no youngsters. These are all adults. As we all know, adults are inescapably more boring than children. And so I guess this would be like me and Steve and Ralph sitting in the water here, whiling away our time. Uh, sort of talking amongst ourselves every so often, doing a flip about and having an argument, but basically not doing a great deal at all. As opposed to Chitradam, which is like one of the schools we deal with. Uh, quite amusing from... <laughs> quite amusing from afar, but also quite difficult to manage if you happen to be in control, which, of course, the pod master, the pod master must be. Hi guys, are you on your own now? Have you lost your friends? Yes, the hippo. That's what I'm talking about. They're also very shy here. They don't tend to uh, put their heads up much. But it is another perfectly still, glorious afternoon out here. Very like yesterday's was. And I said yesterday that I thought it might be cloudy this morning because it was so still, but it wasn't. It is a perfectly clear morning as well. Hopefully tomorrow will be the same. Oh, it's precious. Holly, you're wondering what happened to the eighth baby gosling? I'm afraid we don't know. An unknown fate befell it. It was perhaps snatched by a... it could have been a grey heron, they could have come past and snatched one, it could have been a fish eagle, it could have just been sick and drowned, it could have been uh, something even smaller could have attacked it, I guess, it could have been a little sparrowhawk or something like this. I think it probably would have been perfectly safe in the water, unless, you know, it's also possible that a terrapin took it. Terrapins will grab birds and pull them under the water from time to time, a really big terrapin, and so maybe it was a terrapin. But also, when they get out of the water, they tend to spread out a bit. And it's then that they're most vulnerable, because the parents are vicious. 
You try and get near those goslings if the parents are around, and they will kick up hellfire. I can only think that the parents, for some reason, be either distracted or unable to, for some reason, to chase off the predator. Gina, you're wondering if there are crocodiles in here. Uh, I haven't been here for a long time. I don't know when the last time one was here, actually. There is a terrapin. I think it would be very difficult to pick up. I originally thought it was a dab chick, but it's not a dab chick. No, it's gone under the water. There's a the terrapin. It's a bit closer by. You can see that popping its shell up. Can you see it there? It might just pop its nose out of the water as well. There it is. Got him. No, no. Keep looking. Keep looking. It might pop its head out there. Its head's out again. No, no. Never mind. I, I reckon they're probably in excess of a hundred. No, three or four hundred terrapins in here from the number that you can see popping their heads up and out of the water. All of them are carnivorous, and while they'll mostly eat insects and, and things, they could easily get hold of a small, baby, little, tiny, fluffy gosling. Let's go back to Stivovo. He's probably about three kilometers as the chloro flies with the dewlapped old fellow, Tingana. Indeed, and talking about old fellows, I would love to know what James was talking about there, about old fellows and comparing some of us to the hippos at Bivolsuk Dam. I wonder. <laughs> but here we do. Boring to watch. Okay. Is James saying that we're boring to watch? Kids definitely are more fun to watch. So he's just walking in front of us here. He's walking directly towards um, to the main road, Gowrie Main. So potentially going back to Juma. Or, or maybe in... I um, was oh, definitely interested in some Impala. Definitely interested in Impala here. And Nandini, a leopard ideally will try to kill its prey in the shortest amount of time as possible. Um, a, a skillful cat will suffocate its prey around the throat or around the nose immediately. Um, but sometimes it doesn't manage to get it right there, like on a warthog, and it leads to the animal screaming. And what a distress call does is it attracts other predators, so it's in the best interest for a leopard to kill very quickly and very silently. doesn't always work but it is ideal for them to do so. So from seconds to 30 seconds as quick as possible. But I've seen leopards try to kill a warthog that took a very, very long time. Very long time, because it was afraid to go near the face and the throat. The radio is alive with everybody wanting to see this beautiful cat, of course. So we are going to make some space so as to preserve some friendships in and around here. And I hope you're all okay with that. A lot of people would like to see a leopard this afternoon, and I think we've had a very nice look. We're going to move off back down to the dam and give these guys some space. Oh. Well, there we go. That guy's leaving, so we can, we can stay then if these guys are going to stay then we will stay I was going to be very, very polite there but considering as that gentleman has made a very nice space for us then we will just stay and if it starts getting loud again on the radio then by all means we will make some space we don't want to hog up all of the Duke's time do we <laughs> It's one of those sort of things out here. So you want everyone to be able to see the cat. Minamu, okay, so male leopard will, as long as he's territorial and able to exert dominance, he will breed from the ages of three and a half, four. Some, something can, sometimes can be even younger than that, up until um, about now, 11, 12. Yeah, I got him there, Sip. 
11 or 12, and females probably about the same. I mean, Tundi's 12 years old, and Tristan's quite certain. He's one of the other guides, if you don't know Tristan, he's on leave. Well, actually, not on leave, I keep getting it wrong. He's up in the Mara. But um, Tristan reckons that uh, Tundi with Klalamba is going to be her last litter. Um, as the leopard females get older, they start having less youngsters, and we reckon Klalamba is probably going to be her last offspring that she introduces to the Sabi Sands. And that's kind of like the way it works. You know, 12 is, is an old, 12, 13, 14 is an old leopard. And it's, it's just difficult for them to s secure food for not just themselves, but for their cubs as they get a bit older. So those are the kind of the statistics I'm working with. Saskia, there are many, many lodges in the Savi Sands. There's Nkoro, there's uh, Arethusa, there's uh, Chitwa, where we are, um, Elephant Plains, uh, Sylvans, and that's just up in the north. And they've all got a number of vehicles and a number of guests that come into camp. And uh, so they are all out in these areas looking for these animals. Uh, it's why we have the radio to communicate and to keep in touch. And so. For example, we were sitting there about to do the drone, and Peter, who comes from Nkoro, he managed to give us a very nice update that, um, oh, just by the way, there's a leopard here. We're like, okay, just by the way, we would like to come in and see Duke. And uh, that adds to our lovely Wednesday cat special. And he's definitely in the mood for a little snack. Amazing how he just lay down there just lay down and he's now invisible so for example the one gentleman who's coming into the site now his name is Ari I actually trained him he could training years ago he works at Nkoro and he was one of the vehicles that got me into uh, the Tingana and Hosanna sighting on my interview so without the radio and without assistance from these people it's very hard to find these animals on your own yes we do bump them from time to time yes we do have a lot of luck but trying to scour this entire reserve for, for wildlife on your own is very difficult. So using the radio can make it very, very easy, or a lot easier anyway. And so there is a kind of like a, a respect. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of element of, of space, element of allow others to come in. And he has disappeared. Tingana has decided to lay down. You can imagine if he wasn't moving, how would we know? Okay, well, we're going to wait for him to come out, and while we do so, let's go over to Ralph and see what he's up to. So, everyone, it looks like that's very exciting. Well done, Steve, on finding Tingana. And um, here we go with James, who we've spotted them. Hello, James. <laughs> Hi, guys. James taking photos of us as we're videoing him. <laughs> Senza, I'll drive you over, buddy. <laughs> Hello. Hello, James. Are you going to uh, have a look at the gosling? I'm going to, I'm trying to find these elephants. They're giving me the runaround. Now, there's some, see, we can hear sounds in the north of the dam. Uh huh. But we, of course, have got to head home. Which dam? The big one you're going to now. Oh, fantastic. Okay, well, we'll try and find him. Good. Thanks, Senzo. I'll give you two seconds and then you're flat. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. See you later. That's good intelligence uh, that we've got there from James. So we'll go and look for these uh, elephants if he's heard them because we were getting some fresh signs there. Um, and uh, great that Steve has found Tingana. Um, and uh, just some other news from the underground is that they've got um, Tundi and Cub over on Torchwood. And uh, they're doing very well. So just so that you know, um, they've disappeared over that side, but um, alive and well. So, James says just to the northern side of Biffles Hook Dam. Now, Sammy Jane, um, well, I was thinking exactly the same as you, wondering if there's any elephants here at all. I'm not going to stop at Biffles Hook Dam here because Scuba Steve is doing his usual disappearing act 
and we won't disturb him. I think he's still waiting for his girlfriend to come back. But um, yes, it has been a little bit of um, a difficulty uh, trying to find these elephants. Well, I know that they're here. We can smell them. We can hear them. We can see their tracks. But I haven't been able to see any since I got back. So that's actually my mission today was to try and find some. But I'm sure they're going to give me the slip again as well. But let's see. James heard them over on the other side of the dam here. So that's, and I've still got lots of tracks on the road. It's a small breeding herd. So because, and you can tell that because there's lots of small little tracks along with the big ones. And generally the bulls are massive, but these are sort of medium-sized adults with little tiny ones and also little tiny droppings as well, about the size of my fist. So it's still quite big, but um, for an elephant, very small. So let's head on up this way just a little bit. Okay, so while we follow up on this intel that James has given us, um, let's head back to him who is doing, James is doing something quite strange with his stick. I'm not sitting on my stick, that would be a silly thing to do. I'm looking at a flower. Now, the, I'm not looking at the flower for the sake of looking at the flower. I'm looking at the flower because Stefan told me something interesting about the flower, because Stefan just bought a new book on insects, which has lots of interesting, interesting information in it. And I'm going to tell you some of it now. It is second-hand because I haven't actually read it. This flower, Solanum panduriformi, is very clever. And apparently what the flowers do is they burst open... In fact, I don't think it's the flower that bursts open. I think it is probably the sort of yellow bit there where the pollen is. It bursts open when it is in the presence of a certain frequency of sound wave. Now, that sound wave is the general pitch produced by a bee's wings. So if a bee goes past like this, As it goes past, this thing will go poof, and spit out. It'll burst open under the pressure of the sound wave created by the bzzz, coating the bee in pollen. And the bee will then fly off and possibly land on another solanum plant and pollinate it. Isn't that brilliant? And apparently you can replicate this by taking a tuning fork at the same frequency, and I have no idea what frequency it is or what note it's producing, but you can replicate it if you tap the tuning fork and it makes the noise, it generates the same frequency and holds it next to the flower, it will burst its pollen out. Is that not a fascinating thing? I will read further about it. Uh, Kirsten doesn't think it's fascinating in the slightest, but I think it's really fascinating. And I will read further about it, and I will tell you more once I have stolen Steph's book from him. So that is Solanum pangeri for me, or the poison apple. And I think, there, I mean, there are lots of Solanum species. That's just one of them. All right. Good stuff. On we go. I must just tell you, as we walk through here, wondering what to show you next, other than the glorious sunset that is taking place. Tomorrow we have a very exciting world premiere. Uh, that's, it's going to be an invisible world premiere for you. It will be the world premiere of Lucky Lucinda Luke, who is uh, our latest addition to the directing team. And so uh, tomorrow afternoon I'm going to ask you to all be very kind to him as he begins. And he is, in fact, our first boy director. Now, we're all quite nervous about that because, as we know, no men can, A, concentrate for more than three hours at a time. So we're right on the outer limits of that. And, B, uh, men are supposed to be unable to multitask. Well, if ever there was a job that required multitasking, it's directing, but... Uh, Lucky Luke seems to be as uh, sort of cool in the head as, um, well, uh, well, I wouldn't quite say psychopath, but he's certainly very cool. And so I don't estimate that we shall have any trouble with Luke or his ability to concentrate or panic under the strain of directing uh, people like me and Brent Leo Smith. This is the turpentine grass which I've told you about, and so let's go back to Steve, who is repositioning for Tinga Nana.
<laughs> We're not repositioning. I'm getting out of dodge because the radio is going absolutely ballistic. It's as if no one has ever seen a leopard here before. So we just moved out. Uh, let them have Tingana for a little while. He's probably going to cross Gowrie Main soon. So let them have him. Shame. It's as if leopards don't exist here. We will find another one at some point. But maybe they are finding it all very difficult to find leopards this afternoon. But don't worry, we will do our own thing. We'll move out. We go back down to Chitra Dam, I think. What do you think, Seb? Maybe we'll find that elephant bull that we saw earlier. Hello, Matthew, age 10. Matthew, age 10, would like to know who chooses these leopard names. And uh, essentially, a lot of it gets discussed amongst amongst uh, the the guides that work here, and then uh, they kind of have a format and see what it sounds like and does it work. And I'm just going to pull over here because we've got an enormous amount of traffic all of a sudden. Let me just switch off and take a deep breath. Okay. Okay, everybody is out and about this afternoon for a leopard and the Tingana is probably going to cross the road very shortly, Matthew, into um, Torchwood over here. And there's a male in parlor right over here that might be very, he might be very interested in them. But so the guides that work in and around here, the local guys, they will come up with the names or the names will be put forward. And then as a panel, they will choose the name that's more relevant or most relevant. Sometimes it's got to do with um, the property that that leopard was found on, uh, where it was born, who found the den site, and then we kind of work from that. So I hope that answers your question. I think we might just move up here and keep our eyes peeled. What do you reckon, Seb? Because we know the Duke likes to come across and then back into Juma, and uh, all of those guys can't follow, so maybe we can be a bit sneaky here. The Impala will surely tell us where he is. Well, while we wait here for the, the movement of this beautiful cat to re-emerge into the open, let's go to Ralph and his search for elephant. Well, everyone, it's as I thought. Um, these elephants have, uh, like all the other animals, uh, made their way off into Torchwood. So that's on our right hand side here. Yeah? And uh, well, we're not allowed to go there. So we'll have to make our change to the plan. And that's now, I think we're going to look for uh, some of the alternative leopards uh, a little bit closer towards camp. Um, with Steve having found Tingana, I'm going to try my luck with trying to find Hosanna. Uh, he was quite near to camp yesterday and, and the area he moved towards last night is where I'm going to start the search. But uh, having said that, I mean he could be at Chitwe by now. Uh, he could be anywhere on the concession, he could be out of the concession. But uh, that's where we last heard him and um, he was around camp last night. Lots of alarm calling going on. So we'll head off and see if we can pick up with him. Who knows, maybe Shadulu is back on the property. So we'll head into that area where she likes moving around as well. So that's the plan. Minamu, thank you for your question. A, a, a leopard can hold his territory. Um, a, a nice big male leopard um, could hold its territory for anything between three and sort of six years it's quite a, quite a long time six years but I would say in general four to five years um, where ultimately you would then have a challenger then coming in like you've got now with Hukumuri that's come in and obviously the other two males have enjoyed their time um, holding this territory but now there's obviously a new new kid on the block and uh, he's He's a very big male leopard, and uh, so they're, they're, they're feeling the, the pinch a little bit. They're still holding their territory, um, but he's moving in and out and obviously making things a little bit difficult for them. So that's generally, you know, there's no, there's no clear-cut sign uh, or, or time that leopards will have. Um, 
and it all depends on the dynamics of how many leopards there are in the area, the resources, etc. But I would say in general about four to five years um, and you can have a lot more than that and you can also have just a year or two, uh, even less sometimes they just come and you can have a quick changeover of leopards uh, depending on on the exact space and what's happening in the dynamics of the ratios of sex ratios etc and um, as I say coming back to the resources as well if there's not much going on and you've got a spot where there is some resources well you'll have a lot of leopards in fighting over the same place so as we continue on the search for these uh, elusive spotted cats let's head you on over to James and see if he's been able to find any tracks We found tracks of the elephants uh, that went north into Biffle's Hook. Uh, I think we were probably only about 45 minutes behind them or so. It looked like they'd come through here about 3 o'clock, said Rex. I'm not sure quite how he told exactly to that hour, but that's what he said. Now, I believe that many of you are concernedly asking about my laptop. It's very kind of you to do that. Uh, many of you know that I spilled coffee on it the other day. Uh, very kind of you to all ask. Now, remember, that very same day... We were offered a thousand five hundred rand odd, uh, that is uh, one hundred and fifty dollars, to wade across the treehouse dam. Well, I mean, the only reason we did that, as Senzel pointed out to me now, so that I could buy a new laptop. But yet, no, I've yet to receive that money, so I don't have a computer. Oh, okay. I am, of course, joking. Uh, the laptop is absolutely fine, thankfully. There's no problems with it at all. Now, we've in a tributary, I guess you would say, of the great Umloamati drainage, which is the big river that runs through Juma. And I'm struck by the amount of grass here. Now, we're standing basically in a little field of panicum grass, which, of course, is the guinea grass. It's massively nutritious. And yet it has grown in an uneaten stand here. And that tells me, uh, I was walking along thinking, but surely the carrying capacity of this place, nothing's controlling it. Why wouldn't there be buffalo here? Why wouldn't there be elephants eating here? And I guess the carrying capacity of a place, of course, is defined by its dry season or, yeah, its dry season carrying capacity. And clearly this area, after that large drought that we had, has a reduced... Uh, it's difficult to say that the pop, yeah, I think it probably has. The Greater Kruger Park has a reduced population of large browsing. And so you find these huge sources of nutrition that are going to go moribund and nothing's going to eat them. And I just find that sort of almost wasteful, but I guess it isn't. All the carbon will go back. Hmm? Now. Ryan in Texas, you're wondering what kind of plants or trees have the longest lifespan. I'm going to give you two answers to that. Here is a spider. There is the spider. Can you see the spider, Sinzel? Mm -hmm. And it's suspended its little egg sac up here, and I think it's one of the wolf spiders. behind. Just stand up. Okay. Every time Senzel bends over slightly, the signal moves. Okay, so there's a spider. It's suspended its, its egg sac there. I'll answer the age question while you have a look at it. Stay upright, Senzel. Don't lean backwards now. <laughs> so the longest living tree out here, I would suspect, is probably the baobab. We don't get baobabs this far south. And so you'd find a baobab, I guess... Uh, well, the further south baobab is actually in the Timbavati, uh, not too far from here. It's about, the actual tree is probably about 50 kilometers to the north of us. So that's where the further south one is. But in the Kruger, I guess that would be the longest living tree. But I remember a lecturer of mine at university once saying to me that grasses can sometimes get to be thousands of years old. And I said that that's, uh, you know, everyone looked at her as though she'd stepped out of a piece of cheese. But of course, if a grass is not an annual, if it's a perennial, there's no reason that shouldn't happen because they reproduce vegetatively. So in theory, if you have got a grass plant, let me walk it out for you. If you've got a grass plant like this panicum, and 
you know, it's, it, it seeds and it grows into a little tuft. And then eventually that tuft gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And what will happen is that it will split. The middle part might die off. But now you have basically two pieces of the same plant, but they're not connected anymore. But they were the same organism. And so they must be considered the same organism. And then it, they reproduce vegetatively. So they reproduce, they stick out little stolons or rhizomes, and another tuft comes up with exactly the same or identical genetics to the plant that is now, say, three or four feet away. And slowly, this very same plant sort of moves away from itself. And you can imagine how if the area is undisturbed and that plant doesn't die, there's no major drought or uh, it can even go dormant during a drought and then survive, you can see how this grass tuft or grass plant might survive, A, a very, very long time, and B, as the same organism but split miles from itself by just repeated years and years of vegetative reproduction. Huh? Can you imagine that? I think it's quite fascinating to think of something like a Thermida triandra plant or a little grass tuft being older than some baobabs. Because we tend to think of grass plants, of course, as being, well, fairly short-lived. Mm -hmm. Oh, pangolin. Pangolin, pangolin, pangolin. You say, can I find you a potato? I feel... Terribly sorry about that. James is obviously wowing you with such, so much amazing information that he lost his signal. And we've had a beautiful waterbuck family walk all the way past through the long grass. And we are still watching the small herd of Impala, and we are hoping that the Duke will make his way in this general direction. The radio has gone very quiet, so I don't know why that is, but uh, the Impala will be the first to let us know if Tingana is on his way through, and his general sort of direction was kind of in this way. So I don't hear the vehicles anymore. Be marvelous to get another look at him if he does come through, especially this nice open patch. Gary, I don't think a leopard will necessarily, an old leopard will necessarily leave an area. Rather, he might just fall into a smaller, comfortable spot within his territory and uh, stop doing the territorial sort of behavior. Or that territory will come smaller and smaller and smaller until it's essentially a micro territory. And um, what I think they saw with Mvula is he was displaced by Tingana. He was a big male leopard in this area. Tingana took over his territory, and he was found many times all over the place, just kind of moving through, kind of minding his own business and hunting where need be and probably scavenging where need be, stealing food off of female leopards and who knows what else. But they just kind of become a much quiet individual. They stop the territorial behavior and kind of settle into a life of retirement. That is what I think happens. It's beautiful afternoon light on these Impala. They're moving general direction towards Chitwa Waterhole. They are quite water dependent Impala. So they will drink regularly, and they're never found too far away from water, just like the water buck we have on the termite mound to the right there, Seb. They've decided to come back. There they are. Andrew, it is Sebastian Rombi. He is on camera, and indeed, I think it is magnificent camera work. It's thank so you. good thank that, and he is thanking you back, and um, it's so good that the water buck have decided to come back into a cameo pose on top of that termite mound. They are even more water dependent than the impala we just saw, and very bulk grazer. They need about 60 liters of water a day. They only weigh about 250 kilograms. A buffalo who weighs three times that needs 36 liters a day. So the water buck's need for water is enormous. And you can see it in their dung. Their dung is always very, very wet. 
but they have evolved to be in very aquatic, moist climates, and so their need to drink is very, very high. Maybe it's because they get so hot because that big shaggy coat that they are sporting. The evening is slowly starting to dawn on us. The colours are changing. I tried calling on the radio to see if anyone would give us an update about Tingana's movements and nothing at all. Nothing at all. So we might pop out on the road there in a little bit and see what's happened. I know that one of the here we go, excuse me, he's calling me now. Standing by. Fantastic. I'm making my way. Confirm I'll get you on Gary Main. Okay, so it looks like the, the madness is quietened down. And we are going to quickly zoom through there and spend some time with him. Why not? Seems like the waterbucks movement has been completely arrested by the fact that there is a big male leopard in the area. Well, while we continue on, I thought Ralph had stopped his search for elephants, but it seems like he's back on it. So let's go to him and see what he has to say. Yes, we are on the search, everyone. We've come back to uh, Voyatella Dam. Just to pop in and have a look here, and as I said, the idea being that we're going to try and follow up on Hosanna a little bit. Um, there's nothing here at the dam itself, but um, we're gonna. He was spotted here yesterday evening, so this is where we're starting now. Perfect time of the evening for him to be nice and active. So we've got a good chance to find him if he is still around. Um, there's every chance he may have moved off. Anyway, we've got a lot of wildebeest up ahead here as we started the game drive. They've all moved down now onto this plane and it looks like heading towards the water. Maybe they've already had a drink. Maybe they're going to still have one. I'm not quite sure. But the Impala seem to have come with them. And maybe we'll just go and sit with them for a minute or two and just see if they pick up any movement of any predators. As I say, one of my mentors always told me, if you're trying to find a predator, stay near to the food. And here we come. I wonder where the zebra have moved off. Maybe they're still up on quarantine. Uh, Jamie, that's a very good question. Uh, the human equivalent of scent marking, well, um, Jamie, it's marking your territory. So I, I would have to say something like, um, you know, staking your claim. So we uh, probably the first kind of humans were the ones that rode out on their horses and they staked their claim with a little red flag and they put one flag down then they rode off and and put another one down and made a big square and that was their uh, property that they were then claiming off. Um, but uh, I'd say modern humans well, it's where you go and get your, um, once you buy yourself a property and, and you get your title deed maybe, um, but I would say maybe on a smaller scale it's uh, wearing deodorant um, or with the ladies, maybe something like Chanel number no. 5, putting your perfume on, marking your, uh, or getting some smell in your, in your personal space and that other people can then smell you as well. I suppose everybody's different, but uh, we do have a primeval sort of instinctive nature to us, regardless of how civilized we think we are. The impala just next to us making some noise, but that's not uh, alarm calling. You see, that's rutting. Look how they're chasing each other. Looks like, is that a young male? Yep, see, one of the big males chasing off with a youngster. He's probably getting a little bit too 
big for his boots. So that bigger male now is just putting him in his place a bit and telling him, you either pull your weight or off you go. So we just waiting for these impala to let us know uh, if there's any leopard around. And speaking of leopard, Steve's found his again. Yes, we have. We're back with Tingana. He's only a meter from the road itself. Kirst, I would suggest getting Ralph to check Treehouse Dam area if he wants to find Osana. That's where I had his tracks headed this morning. So I'll definitely make a little turn around there if he's got the time. And here is Osana's dad, Tingana, the Duke of Juma. Although he is on Chitra at the moment, he's only meters inside of Chitra. On our left hand side is Torchwood. And I mean, if Seb just pans out a little bit, here he comes. He is so invisible. I could, I mean, I, I was parked here for 30 seconds before I could see him. What have you seen, my boy? Oh, there goes some water back across the road in front of us there. Don't think that's what he was looking at. The sense of sight and pretty much everything is so far more in tune than ours. And here he is in the road. Isn't that a beautiful cat? Yes, Monica, just gorgeous. And this is why we, we track on the roads, because they like to use roads. It's very quiet on their feet. They don't make any noise. And then as soon as they detect any prey upwind or left or right of them, then they'll move in that direction. So we're going to start up and see if we can stay with him. He's definitely got his eyes on something. He's not sure what. We don't want to disturb him, though. The aging Duke needs every meal he can get. So we'll just follow him. As soon as we spot whatever it is he's kind of having a look at, he might only be hearing something, because I couldn't see anything in the distance apart from that water buck that crossed the road. And that herd of impala were slowly moving down here as well. And a lot of animals will start making their way sort of to Chitwater Hole and to the open area there as night falls. This is probably one of his ploys to spend time in and around the area of abundance. Bree Bree, it is very calming to watch his paws on the sand. I'm going to just stay right there because he's going to go, if he keeps going forward like that, we're going to lose him in uh, Torchwood, but um, that is okay, because we've had a marvelous time with this, the Duke, and he is such a beautiful cat, it's a beautiful, beautiful cat. That posture, he's still looking in great condition, you know, as soon as a leopard starts losing condition, you really see it sort of in the hips, in that sort of area, yeah, that's it, Tingana, stay on the road for us. Catch something on the other side of the road. Andrew, if we go onto another property, it's essentially trespassing. So you don't want to do that. Uh, we should know better. So if I went over there, I would deliberately be trespassing rather than accidentally trespassing. So that is the problem. It's just going onto someone else's land without permission. You just shouldn't do it. Okay, so what is it moving over there? It is some water buck that he's looking at in the thickets. I'm just going to... I'm just going to talk to vehicle. 
the station approaching Tingana. Just pull up here next to me. He is uh, busy stalking what looks like some water buck off to our left. Okay, so he's very low in the grass. Let's watch this. Let's see how he's going to do with water buck. We're not going to make any noise. There's the water buck there. As I say, that other vehicle starts. Yasna. Yeah, Yas has got eyes on some water buck just up ahead there. So he might try and take a water buck. I've seen I've seen leopards uh, kill water buck a few times in my life. Male leopards. I've even seen a male leopard tree a female water buck, which is an enormous amount of weight to go up a tree. Um, he would obviously be trying to select for the smallest individual in the herd, and there's a small herd over there. He's just disappeared flat in the grass there on the Torchwood fire break now. Uh, he's just crossed the road, Gowrie Main. Chitwa Chitwa is on the right hand side and Torchwood is on the left. And it's amazing how he has just vanished in the long grass. The grass isn't even that long. Here he goes. He's running. He's trying to get a... You see how he uses the road for silence? By running through the long grass, he would make noise. So by running along open clearings or along pathways, he makes... Um, yeah, the water buck are cutting across. This is going to be fantastic if we get to see this. There are the water buck. And there is Tingana. And there is a semi sub adult there. Uh, Ryan from Texas, he needs to be within minimum of 20 yards to be able to, to catch whatever it is he needs to get, unless the animal runs at him. Um, if he starts his stalk, or should I say his chase, too soon, uh, the animal will run away. A lot of these antelope are designed for speed and desire to, to run away from an animal very quickly. Uh, but if he can get within sort of that 15, 20 yard sort of distance, he's got a good chance if he's able to remain undetected. Uh, very explosive speed over that distance. And he'll launch himself, but you saw how he ran in the road to lose any detection or make himself very silent. And this is what we see along major game paths, along these roads. And that's why the roads are such an important area for us to check when it comes to, to animal movements. And as you can see now there, his tracks are going to be clearly in the road for anyone that would want to find him. Just going to roll a little bit forward, make no noise at all. Those water buck are no doubt going to cross the road right in front of him. There they are. Look how he's now flat. How he's now flat. They're looking directly at him. Water buck had no idea. If you'd like to, Kirst, most certainly. I think he's a bit far away from the warthog, water buck. They have no idea that he's there. There's the youngster I was talking about. He would like to take that one down. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Safari Live. We are with a big male leopard by the name of Tingana, the Duke of Juna. Juma. We are in Juma, in the Sabi Sands. On my right-hand side is Chitwa Chitwa. And this male leopard is busy stalking some water buck. My name is Steve Falkowich. I'm joined on camera by Seb. And this is fantastic stuff in the afternoon. It's getting quite late. It's getting nice and dark. Uh, he was running along the road to try to sneak up alongside his water buck. But I think he's missed his chance. 
I think he's missed his chance. We are joined by other vehicles in the sighting, uh, landowners from the north. And um, yeah, I think he's given up. That's how it is. The action can unfold very, very quickly, and it can end just as quickly. He didn't quite get close enough along that sort of line that the water buck were using. They are indefinitely, well, they're most definitely moving towards the, the dam, Chitwa waterhole, which is down towards our right. And uh, he didn't cut them off quickly enough. If he'd gotten a little bit further forward, he would quite easily been able to try and catch one of them. But a water buck is no easy meal for a leopard. But he is a big 11 and a half, 12 year old male leopard. He has been the dominant leopard in this area for the last four or five years. And he is the father of many of the youngsters around. Paula, he was watching something. The water buck crossed the road just in front of him. And now he was crouched down flat on the ground. And now he's gone from a very flat crouched leopard to a semi-flat leopard. So I think he's realized that he's missed and he's conserving his energy now. Uh, but his ears are still moving. You can see how they're moving from left to right. This is the perfect time of day for leopards to stalk. They are very opportunistic. And if something moves and is edible, they'll definitely have a go. It's all about energy expenditure. And that's why the movements he's done to get into this position, he's now resting to recoup the energy lost. But I think the chase is over. If you haven't already done, please comment and send your questions to below on the stream. The action started out and ended very quickly, as is what happens on a live broadcast. But I think that might be it for the afternoon. Guide Monkey, he's always listening. Those ears are always moving and moving and moving, picking up whatever sounds that they can. They're very susceptible to any movement, snort or hoof or shuffle in the grass. So even though he looks like he might be at complete rest, something could trigger him and he would immediately react to it. If any of you have got domestic cats back home, you've probably seen that. Your cat is sitting fast asleep. Their ears are twitching, and as soon as something catches their attention, immediately they attack it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for joining us on this very short broadcast. Uh, it is live, and if you'd like to keep watching, we are still on Safari Live, so just Google us and continue the show. Thank you for joining us, and have a good night. still with us folks but I believe, I believe Ralph has managed to find himself his favorite animal yes everyone I have found my favorite animal we're not quite sure which exact individual this is but whichever one it is it looks like a female nice and big and she has just saved the day for me because I was getting quite frustrated not finding much driving around. We've pretty much crossed the entire concession. And she's on the move. She's obviously just gotten up. See, head in the air, trying to sniff out. Right, I'm going to try and catch up with her. She looks like she might have picked up a scent of something. They have such wonderful smells, do hyena, or scent, sense of smell. Maybe picked up on something that she's she looked like she started running off there. Let's just see if we can. Sorry for the shakes, this road is a little bit corrugated. We do need to try and just spot her again. She did start running, so I hope she hasn't crossed the road. Where'd she go now? Let her up ahead, there she is. Yeah, she's going to cross the road now, I think. She's going to come onto the road at least. There she is. See that head up? 
sniffing as she goes, trying to pick up any scents. Incredible. See that lope of the hyena? She could keep that up for hours and hours and hours. And that's not even going that fast. I've seen them going a lot faster than that for three to five hours. So let's catch up with her a little bit. Oh, don't go that side. Don't go that side. It looks like she might be going off into Torchwood. And if she is, we can't follow. It's pretty much where the elephants went. And like I said, it's pretty much where all the animals have gone. It seems it's all happening in Torchwood. Okay, let me try and relocate this hyena. Hopefully it comes back out on the road. While I do that, let's head you on over to James, who is probably right on the last legs of his walk. Well, we are on the last legs, and I'm uh, remaining out here for pangolin's sake. Uh, she or he is looking for a potato bush. Both Rexon and I can smell one somewhere around here. And we're just looking to see if we can't find it. It is that inconspicuous. And I, Panglin, like I say, I hope that you're not going to be deeply disappointed. Let's go down here, regardless. Don't fall, Senzel. They are pretty inconspicuous things. Pretty unimpressive. But I will do my best to find you one. It's the kind of area they'd grow in. I, I, you've heard me say that before, of course. But I, I can't smell it anymore. They're a little bit like, um, I guess they're a little bit like cicadas. Uh, Louise says there's a huge one behind our camp, which is absolutely true. There is. Ooh. No. 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 I mean, I feel like I really should be able to find one before we, you know, rather than take you into our camp to find it. They're all over. I can smell one. Potatoing away. But I'm afraid Phylanthus reticulatus... <laughs> nothing. Phylanthus reticulatus remains very elusive here as the light fades on this Wednesday afternoon. Let's just go up here quickly and see if we don't get very lucky. That light you can see, by the way, is the light of the dam cam. For those of you who watch the Juma dam cam. And pa Pangolin says she can't wait to be disappointed. Well, I, I hate to say this, but I can't wait to disappoint you. Is that, is that, am I allowed to say that? Ah. Huh. And who cares is also looking for potato bush. This is particularly pathetic on my part. The overwhelming sense of crushing pressure I feel right now. Let's look through this thicket. Ooh. No, no, that's a white berry bush. <laughs> and I believe the zoomies are watching us on the dam cam. You can see Senzo patiently traipsing around backwards. Don't fall over, Senzo. No, Rickson's given up because he knows there aren't any around here. No, I'm afraid Pangolin... <laughs> Not this evening. Very embarrassing. Anyway, over there we've got some wildebeest giving a few alarm calls as we walk past. We have the very comforting and twinkling lights of Wuertela Camp as we walk home. And Paula are now screaming at each other. And it would not surprise me if Hosanna was around here somewhere. And Steve has got something far more interesting than me traipsing around looking for something that doesn't exist. And that, of course, is Tingana.
Sorry about that. Apparently there are some uh, battery problems in the microphone pack, which I find absolutely astounding. Anyway, so it goes. I guess those batteries will need to be thrown away. We're still looking, can still smell potato bushes. Mm -mm. No. no, they just don't. I was saying they're a bit like cicadas. You can smell them, but as soon as you get close, you can't smell them anymore. Okay, let's go back to Steve. He's managed to put some batteries in his microphone. We are with him, and he is now moving. And if he goes right, let's go. He's going to scent mark. We are in infrared. There we go. Does he scratch his feet? No, no scratching of the feet there. He's definitely on a border patrol now after being unsuccessful in his hunting. Unsuccessful in his hunting. We are going to follow him and hopefully he's going to go right into Chitwa and not into Torchwood. That would be marvelous. Left, right, left, right. Can you see him deliberating? Um, Barbara, you want to know an interesting question. Um, if cats are scent marking, then they definitely are advertising status. And I think through the smell, other cats are able to pick up exactly who they are, what their reproductive status is, who they are, everything. There are so many things or questions about it that have been possible for us to ascertain. They reckon that the, the pa anal pastings that hyena do have probably got about 80 characteristics to them that the hyena are able to sort of ascertain when it comes to when they smell it. They know the clan size, strength, health, reproductive status, so many things. We can only assume. Possible, impossible for us to guess, though. Seb, I'm going to try to get up on the side of him there, if that's okay with you. He is quite relaxed to the car, folks, so I'm just going to sneak up on the side of him. Okay, well, it looks like Ralph has got his sights set in the distance, so let's go back over to him. Yes, everyone, so that uh, that hyena gave us a slip. She disappeared off into Torchwood. It seemed like she had a, a scent of something. She was on the move, running off with her head held high. But look at this. We're looking out over the Drakensberg. Those are the mountains there in the background. They start here, and they head all the way through into KwaZulu-Natal. And, um, well, that is where J.R.R. Tolkien, um, the author of Lord of the Rings, got his inspiration for for the book that he wrote. Remember the Drakensberg, meaning Dragon Mountains? And he lived um, not anywhere near here, but he was further up in, or further down in, in the KwaZulu-Natal province. And he lived there at the foot of the mountains. And as a child, he used to play and hike up in the mountains. And um, that's where a lot of his inspiration came from. So very interesting indeed. But uh, it's a beautiful scene now as that sun has set and the last colors now start to glow through. And we've got uh, some dead uh, knob thorns and things making it spectacular. That is very pretty. Benjamin, I agree with you. It is a, a very beautiful background. And, well, it's not always that you get lucky with all the wonderful sightings. I've uh, had a little bit of a quiet drive this afternoon. But, well, then you've just got to stop and look at what's going on around you and just appreciate this kind of setting. It is absolutely stunning. I'm just off to our side as well. We've also got the the moon which is uh, now in its waxing gibbous phase it's just up here and very very bright and we've actually not even needed much light in camp because uh, of the brightness of the moon now that's coming through remember once you get past half um, half moon and it's waxing we say waxing gibbous or waning gibbous there it comes nicely now you can see all the craters in the moon very pretty, hey? 
That's one of the things that I will always watch because uh, being a surfer, it's uh, obviously very important with the tides and it's heading towards spring tide now. So in a few days, it's going to be big tides and hopefully there's some good swell arriving with that and that's always the best time to go surfing. But also living near to the ocean, it's all about the tides. Every six hours we have a high tide, low tide. And if you need to go and collect any bait or get out onto the rocks nice and early in the morning when it's low tide, or you always need to know what the sea is doing. Um, and also the surf spots, each different surf spot or fishing spot will be good at low tide or high tide. And the animals are obviously also living according to those uh, change in tides. That little dot in the sky could make such a difference to our planet. Wonderful, though. So, from one lovely scenic uh, picture that we have, let's head you on back to Steve with a beautiful animal. Yeah, thank you very much, Ralph. We are very close to Tingana now, right up beside him. We've had some marvelous shots of his face. His ears are twitching in every direction, his eyes, his body's very alert, but he still has a bit of a catnap in him. He's listening to the sounds around him that pique his interests. What's going on in that mind? Don't touch that dial. Um, that is indeed someone's name. You want to know about eye contact. Well, cats, especially leopards, direct eye contact with the leopard is considered a challenge because they are solitary. So I think with any solitary cat, eye contact is considered a challenge and a threat. With lions, it's very important to maintain eye contact because that is basically showing confidence. But when leopards, for example, the waiting Ghana is sitting now, if another male leopard happened to rock up on the scene, he would not look at him. He would maintain the sideways, po sideways posture. His jowls would, would be very large and hanging, and he'd probably be growling at the same time. And uh, that would be indicating to the other male that I've seen you, and I'm bigger than you, but you don't want... They don't look at each other. As soon as they look at each other, it's a direct, direct challenge. And that could often lead to something more. So if you do encounter a leopard on foot and you need to back away from it you look at it sideways without looking at him directly in the eye that is the best way to do it but every now and again a leopard when we're on the vehicle will look straight through us straight through the soul and it is quite something to experience they really do see straight through you Here he dozes again. He's still lying on the road. We've been with him this entire time. He hasn't deviated too much. I initially saw him moving off to, to spy that herd of waterbuck. And then as they crossed, I think he anticipated them crossing at a different point. Because we, um, where we had stopped behind him previously was a very nice game trail lots of water buck tracks crossing so I think he initially anticipated them crossing at that angle but they deviated very slightly and he lost his opportunity beautiful spots the rosettes of the leopard it is almost completely dark we are with the infrared so we're able to see all of these images beautifully not influencing anybody. There's a vehicle behind us. I'm surprised they haven't put a spotlight on yet. 
Okay, well, while we stay with this night critter, Tingana himself, let's go over to Ralph, who's searching for his own nocturnal animals. Yes, Steve, and, well, it's not as exciting as what you've got, but I tell you what, the other night we were looking out, and after Taylor found a chameleon and she challenged us to find one, well, we did. So I'm looking for little critters like that as well now. And we might find ourselves a little genet or a honey badger or a, or a little chameleon or even a fiery neck nightjar. And you know what? Uh, I know that there was a sighting a little while ago of a pennant winged nightjar, but we won't see the pennant wings at the moment, but we could still see a pennant winged nightjar, but not in breeding plumage. But. Um, they saw it with a, were inbreeding plumage. That was a few months ago. Not now that we're heading into autumn. But uh, that's quite a rare sighting. And it's like a, much like a kite with those long streamers. Nandini? That's a good question. Um, birds don't particularly uh, mark their uh, territories by scent. More what they do is they mark their territory by calling. So like a lion does when he calls or roars, uh, the birds mark their territory more so by uh, all their little calls. And they will actively fly around and defend their territory as well. But the biggest mark that they do do is through audio. Now there's a little gecko that just disappeared in there and there he is. If you can see him, if I stop here he might poke his head out. I think you might just be able to see him there. He was poking his... you can see his foot there. He was poking his head out. There he is. Look at his little head there. There he is. Hello little chap. I'm not exactly sure which gecko this is, but we'll wait and see if he comes out. Yeah, we can see you, but we'll pretend like we can't. Come on out, buddy. Oh, thank you, Steph, in FC, telling me it's a thick-toed gecko. I haven't seen this one before. It looks like the day geckos that we get down in the Eastern Cape. I'm not familiar with this one. I'll have to check him out in the book when I get home as well. And wonderful. It's also time for him to come out. He's obviously spent the whole day hiding up behind that little loose piece of bark there. I think a elephant's possibly made that that injury. Kathy, I agree with you. Very camouflaged indeed. And uh and very nice to see that this is the perfect time for a little gecko to be coming out and starting to do his hunting. You know, I actually think in, in the future, through evolution, we might find that little geckos like this, they actually have a light on their forehead or right on the tip of their nose because then all the moths and everything would fly directly at them and they'd just have to sit there with their mouth open. Because at, at home, when you leave the light on, they all come around the light and the moths and everything are then easy pickings and they get so fat there I've got about five geckos at home that just live um, in my ceiling and come out as soon as I turn the outside light on and then they just sit there and wait for the moths to come to the light oh, that's very very cool and a lot of these uh, like frogs and lizards you can also uh, identifying features is looking at that pupil whether it's vertical, whether it's horizontal, whether it's round, or if it's slitty like that. So that's one of the v real characteristics that you need to look at. And this one, he's got a very clear vertical um, slitty pupil. So that would be a clear characteristic. If you've got two um, brown geckos that look almost identical, then you just start to look at the, at the pupil. But, well, I think let's leave this little guy to carry on his hunting. He's obviously just started off. And, um, well, let's head over to Steve, who's got that big predator uh, with spots. 
Yes, we are still with the big predator with spots. The Duke of Drew who decided from his thumb. Uh, Slightly mobile in the road. He's going to scent marking. Okay. Main roads like this are often very important boundaries. The easily navigatable, navigatable road or pathway. I wonder if they see it as a road or if they see it just as a major game path. But often cats will use river courses, power lines, fence lines, any form of sort of easily accessible pathway. Elephant. Space. Oh, I'm not going to get up there. Wow. <laughs> that is a proper embankment. Sorry about the signal there, folks. We've got someone joining us. Afternoon. After you guys. Enjoy. There we go. That's Ryan from Arethusa. Okay, so it's nice that we're able to get someone else into the sighting. There he is moving. What's he doing? Has he spotted something on the left? Don't go left, Tingana. That is Torchwood Young, sir. Oh, he's smelling something. Someone has visited that bush. Tasman, age seven. There, he's doing the phlegm and grimace. Look at that. He's picked up a urine signature on the branch. And now by lifting his mouth like that, the urine signature goes into the top of the mouth and it indicates all sorts of pheromone sort of things in the brain. A female status, male status, all sorts of things. Now Tasman, age seven, leopards will eat as often as they can, but they can go for a week and a half without eating, but they don't normally do that. They sometimes will eat every day. It all depends on the time of year and the conditions available. But lepers will eat very regularly, but they can go for some time without food because they have such a large protein diet when they do eat. Now, he's very interested in that bush. Probably a female leopard who's come along and scent marked. And he's getting very excited about it. He's rubbing his head in there. I wouldn't be surprised if he turns around now and scent marks on top of her. You can see that. His mouth is still open in that grimace. He's almost looking off into the distance as if whatever female that is is just going to materialize in front of him. But the brain is obviously working out all sorts of things. Yes, Francis from Israel, the females will phlegm and grimace as well. You'll actually see it in many, many animals. Uh, most of the antelope that I've seen do it. Even elephant, but you don't see the grimace in the elephant because they've got an enormous nose. Um, but buffalo do it, rhino, male and female, as well as lots of antelope. You see it with lions, you see it with leopards. You def I've never seen it with hyena, though. I've never there seen them do that. But... Um, Lots of animals do that, and it's accessing the brain, different sort of the Jacobson organ in the roof of the mouth, and it's telling them all sorts of things from status, strength, reproductivity, all sorts of things we can't even fathom to imagine. We can only guess. He's really enjoying this little Facebook status post. Scent marking is just like status posts put on Facebook where people tell you all sorts of things about their lives. I just think scent marking is a little bit more complicated because who cares what someone ate for breakfast? <laughs> okay, well, let's see if we can keep up with him. If I haven't 
beach to myself. The Duke, let's go back over to the Duke. Let's go back over to Ralph and see what he's managed to find. Nothing yet. Um, I'm still looking sharply in the trees for any little bush babies or any of the little chameleons as well. You know what? Sometimes at night it's actually a little bit easier than spotting things than during the day because you very often just see the reflection of the lights. So just using a spotlight like this. Obviously we don't want to shine on the diurnal animals but uh, it can help quite a lot. Kelly, there are a lot of owls in Africa. Uh, starting from the biggest one, uh, we have the Vero's eagle owl, which uh, I spotted the other day down in the Mlawati River. Um, they're as big as uh, an eagle, that's why they call an eagle owl. And then you've got the, the spotted eagle owl, which is slightly smaller. Um, and then the barn owl, which is uh, one of the most common owls I think um, that you find all around the world. I know that you find them in Europe, I think you might find them in Asia as well and the name very apt because they very often nest up in in uh, barns and their call is a very shrill and you might hear them in America as well. I'm not quite sure if their distribution goes there but um, then going smaller we've got wood owls and marsh owls um, and then we've got right down to the little owlets which is um, tiny little birds tiny little owlets that uh, the pearl spotted owlet the little scops owlet the little white faced scops owlet so yes we've got a number of different owls and um, here too we'd also get the barn owl uh, the spotted eagle owl the Vero's eagle owl the um, barred owlet they do a it almost sounds like they start laughing in the end because it's like a whirr, 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 a, a very strange laugh, but a laugh nonetheless. And um, so, yes, we'll be on the lookout for all those little owlets as well. We'll listen out for them and if we hear them. And then a lot of the time the, the, um, the night jars will be sitting on the road. So you'll often see them up in front of you and then they fly up and they catch insects and they fly back down. Um, the owlets, they're more the owls and the owlets, they're more after rodents and little birds and uh, even bats. So we'll also have bats flying around at the moment, the insectivorous bats and the odd fruit bat as well. The fruit bats are rather large bats. Um, but it's not a good time for them at this time of year as well as the insectivorous bats it's almost the end of their season because the insects also become dormant so then they have to move off to go and find better resources as well as the fruit a lot of um, trees don't fruit at this time of year so there's all sorts of nightlife both in the air and on the ground and always good to be keeping your eyes peeled and not good to drive fast as well because you will drive past most of the, the interesting things if you go too fast. I'm going to take a, a loop around quarantine now maybe Hosanna or somebody has popped his nose out or maybe even Shadulu. So I've been hearing the guys quite regularly uh, getting leopards here on quarantine quite late well, late in, in terms of late of the drive, but uh, still early evening. Okay, and speaking of leopards, uh, Steve is still with Tingana, and it seems he's on the move. Well, we are with Tingana, and we the last vehicle that we were with, he's now gone into Chitwa, which we're quite happy about. There he's doing his scent marking. But what is amazing is that as Ryan, who was with us there, turned around, he's now got a female leopard in the road. So I, I'm kind of torn between what to do now. I, chances are the female leopard's going to cross into Tortured, and Tingana now is going to go into the drainage. So we're going to have to make a decision very soon 
about what we're going to do here. <laughs> we're spoiled for leopards all of a sudden. And this drainage here, this drainage is going to be very hard, Seb. Ooh, I don't know about that. There he is. Okay, Kobe, thanks, Ryan. Probably Hosanna or Tamba. So it's not a female. It's actually a male, young male leopard that they've managed to find on the road there. So is it Hosanna come to stake out his claim with his dad? Is it Tamba coming to do something similar? I haven't seen Tamba, the young male leopard, in some time. Yeah, Kirsten's thinking it's Hosanna because he loves to follow Pops around. Seb, I don't think we're going to get through there. I think maybe we should go. Kirst, what do you think? Should we go back and see this cat on the road? What do the viewers want? What do the viewers want to do? Should we try and stay with this cat who's about to disappear? It's drainage system. Or should we go and have a look at whoever that other cat is on the road? Oh, I think I'm going to make a decision and I'm going to turn around because that we're just going to get stuck. Okay. Ryan, I'd love to join you there, please. Okay, so we got to go back there then quickly. Okay, so let's go. We're going to zoom quickly. Let me get out of low range. Ali, yes, Osana is a daddy's boy, and uh, it would not be the first time that he has decided to show up and see his dad. Find it marvelous that he does that, and uh, quite strange at the same time. But it is behavior that we are seeing and we are documenting, and uh, we're going to have to keep our eyes peeled because apparently he was not on the road. Ryan has just left, but he's moving towards the road. So let's keep peeled, shall we? Uh, Ryan, how far from where I left you? So how far from where I left you? Did you see him? Okay, Kobe, thank you. We don't know who it is. The leopard madness continues. He's closer towards cheetah cut line. He's closer towards cheetah cut line than before. Seb has even got his own light out now. We don't want to miss whoever this beautiful cat might be. While we try and find him, let's go back over to Ralph. Yes, well, that seems it's all exciting on Steve's front. Um, he's now trying to relocate there, and well, I'm just trying to locate anything. Um, but that's uh, the joys of being out in the bush and wild animals doing whatever they want to, whenever they want to. And we've got no time frames for when they're going to do anything. All we know now is, is that we should be seeing lots of night active animals. I haven't seen too many for the moment. There's lots of insects coming for the light, but um, I haven't seen any of the birds just yet. And I haven't heard too much either. Sometimes a little bit of a slow start. Now, poke purple. Um, we do get wild dogs and serval here. It's quite rare to to see serval but there is a there is a chance we can see them remember i think they also move around more so during the day um, but quite rare to spot them and wild dogs yes we get wild dogs here too but they're very nomadic and they come through and they go back um, so and we've you know the greater kruger national park is it's about 2.2 million hectares um, and uh, that's the size of almost about the same size as Israel. So there's there's a lot of different uh, packs of, of wild dogs and they move and groove wherever they want to within this whole greater area. No fences within that uh, park. 
So they sometimes come through and they stay in the area and other times they just keep going. Well, it seems like Steve's on fire. He's got all the action on his side. Let's go over to him. can't help that patient's pants are working off this afternoon. It, this does indeed appear to be Hosanna. Let's see. James Richard showed me something about the, the bottom of his tail. Can you see the bottom of his tail, Seb? Just where the tail meets. No, you can't see it there. There's like a nuclear sign there where his tail meets his bottom. You can't really see it, but I saw three spots on the right-hand side. And three spots on the left. It looks like Osana, indeed. Ryan initially thought it was a female leopard, and he's come in maybe 50 to, four, 50 to 80 meters further west than where Tagana came out. So it's almost as if he can smell Daddy-O in the air, and he's trying to find him. How marvelous is that? He's looking into the darkness, Bear in mind, folks, we're on infrared. It is impossible to see. And he is looking straight into where we had Impala earlier, by that small pan as you come into Chitwa from Gauri, Maine. We're not far from that junction at all. And he's looking straight in that direction for, we're not quite sure what, but he's listening. He doesn't seem to have spotted anything. That is indeed Hosanna. Does everybody agree with me? So he's probably been walking from where we left his tracks this morning and he's probably been this entire time walking all this way because he likes to jump between Chitwa and Juma. Uh, if you didn't know it before, this is indeed my favorite leopard. Well, thank you, James Richard, for confirming it. I'm getting much better at my identification. I know last night I found it quite difficult because he was crouched down looking at us I couldn't get a look at the spot pattern and the eyes were wild as leopards eyes can be and on foot it doesn't really matter who the leopard is when you're on foot that's a leopard on foot and last night was one of the highlights of my year I think definitely highlight of the year when we found Hosanna last night it was last night Barbara you are 100% correct. Hosanna is not your average leopard. I think that's why we love him so much. Definitely one of the crowd favorites out there. He definitely gets enough air time. And Penny, I think by the age, by the time Hosanna becomes able to challenge for territory, I think Tangana will be, will be well into retirement. I mean, I don't think Osana's got it in him for at least another year, if less than that, maybe. But, I mean, he wouldn't be able to take on the Duke right now. There's a, it's still a noticeable size difference. There's a skill difference. I mean, I, I wonder if Osana's even been in a proper fight before. So and that is what happens when you want to challenge for territories. You need to have fought a number of times and probably lost a number of times to, to be able to um, sort of achieve a victory. Someone's calling me. Uh, standing by. No, I'm stationary on uh, Chitra Access with Gary Man. Okay, someone was uh, calling me, but it wasn't actually me. Well, it seems like Ralph has found one of Hosanna's favorite meals, so let's quickly go over to him before it dashes away. Yes, everyone, and this is a Cape Scrub here. Look at that lovely, nice close-up of this little guy. And a very good um, sort of indication between a precocial and altricial, if you know those two terms. Precocial and altricial, between hares and rabbits. Precocial, and being the animals that are sort of born ready to go, and that that is grouped in with the hares. They their young are born above the ground with hair. Their eyes open very quickly, and they're able to run off very fast. Whereas um, the rabbits, 
They are born underground, they are hairless, their eyes are closed, and they are pretty much useless for the first while. So they need to gain in strength, they need to be fed by mommy, and um, they are not able to move around very easily. So a nice good indication between the two ultracial and precocial babies, between hares and rabbits. Crazy shady, uh, I think quite, there's probably quite a big uh, mortality rate of uh, scrub hares that die every night. Um, but, you know, they're quite fast, so they, they can move, and they've got those big ears, so they can hear animals coming. But um, it's from jackals to caracal to black-footed cats to leopard to hyena. So they need to breed a lot because they get eaten a lot. So high mortality rate equals high natality rate. Natal, natality is the birth rate. So they've got to have a higher natality rate than, a, than the mortality rate. Otherwise we wouldn't be seeing them. They would be extinct. So I think let's carry on down the road and see what else we can find. But I think that might be the last you see of me because uh, Steve's got Hosanna and well, that's too exciting not to miss. Over to him. Yes, we are. We have officially confirmed through James, Richard and myself the Hosanna, the little chief, the little prince. And that look I'm getting so familiar with at the night time with those enormous pupils. His beautiful eyes, you can't really see the color of them in the darkness, but they're a beautiful brown color. Um, Tumba's got beautiful blue eyes and enormous ears. And Hosanna has made his way. He seems to be popping from dam to dam, from Voyatella to Chitwa, as if it is a game of ping pong. And he has moved only a few meters further into Chitwa as we arrived. And he's just listening. There's hardly any air whatsoever. He's listening. His ears are perked. His eyes are alert. You can see there's a little bit of air movement behind him there, but it's not really much to be pushing any animal scent towards him. Paula, he does have such intense eyes, but when the, the light is on, those eyes aren't that intense, but it's because we're looking with infrared, so the pupils are enormous. He's taking in as much light as possible from this very dark evening, and that's why it looks very daunting when you see those enormous pupils. If anyone's seen their house cat come running in from the darkness with those wild, wild-eyed pupils, and there's always something quite special to behold. And here we are with the little prince, in the almost pitch darkness, there's only a bit of over a half a moon in the sky. Um, I'm looking over my shoulder to see him. And no, don't go that way, Hosanna. We've only got two minutes left. Don't go and spoil the show by walking back to the road. Okay, well, what has he spotted? What is he smelling? Let's see if we can keep up with him. Maybe he's looking for his dad. Okay, let's go. He's now going to walk, probably as Tingana has been doing, walking in the road. There he goes. It's not a party without Dad, it appears. So, <laughs> so folks, it's been a marvelous afternoon with uh, not one, but two leopards. And uh, from all of us on this side, spending time with leopards and hippos is what we do. And we're going to definitely try and keep the camera on him. Enough of looking at my my average face. Let's watch the beautiful cat Hosanna as he meanders into the distance, following east the same trail his dad did. It's been a fantastic evening. FC, Luke and Kirsten that side. James on bushwalk with Rexon. Uh, Ralph having a marvelous afternoon finding hyena and us with the leopards. It is always a special afternoon in Juma and the Cyber Sands. Thank you for your comments, questions, and we will be live tomorrow morning, bright and early. Have a beautiful evening, and we'll see you then.